long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, an uncomplicatedly good and honest man. And I'm your co-host, relative king newbie Matt Freeman, an ambiguously good man with a worrisome violent streak. But also, I like dogs. Whew. This week on the show, we continue to explore King's second novel ever, Salem's Lot, and cover chapter three, The Lot, one. It's a lot of numbers. We spend, we spend a day in the life of the residents of Salem's Lot, which includes dead dogs, beaten babies, and a psycho bus driver. What a town. Matt, what did you think of this week's reading? Uh, I mean, I loved it. I think this is King absolutely playing to his strengths. He's sort of just showing off for, mm-hmm. for this this whole chapter. It's It's... My favorite part of the book so far, honestly, I I was into the book prior to now, but this was this is sort of the equivalent to the uh, the first Eddie Dean chapter of the Dark Tower, where oh nice, where, where I went from like okay yeah this this is well done to like okay I'm into this now and uh, uh, yeah like like I don't know I'm gonna have so much to say about it, but I think that there's a kind of specific space that King is going for with most if not all of these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, which we sort of alluded to on in our intro joke, where there's sort of a, <laughs> there's sort of an ambiguity to all of them. None of them you can just pin down and say like this person just sucks purely. Yeah. Um, and I think that's intentional, and I and I can't wait to get into like all the different kind of ways in which he does that. Yeah, I mean, I I have a friend who's reading Salem's Lot right now um, along with us, and he messaged. He's read it, and he messaged me today, going, "I can't believe how much of it is in this book." And not not to say that King like copied himself, but just that like this chapter by itself is like gets to the core of who Stephen King is as a writer, which is why I'm like so glad we get to cover it like all at once. We don't have to mix this with any other conversation. This all we're doing today is just this chapter. I'm really yeah. excited about that. I think it's worth taking the time to really dive into what he's doing here and how he's doing it and why he's doing it. And I agree with you. This is a, a brilliant, brilliant chapter. It's so good. Yeah, it's it's such a flex for a, a second time novelist too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, it shows so much confidence and, like I said, showing off is how it strikes me. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, can't wait to go into detail. Yeah, so let's uh, waste no further adieus and get into that. Except we've got we've got a few more adieus actually, so we're gonna waste some adieus. Um, we just wanted to before we jump into our show this week, we just want to remind you guys that. While we spend a lot of time doing this podcast, it is not the only thing we do. We have another show called The Doofcast, which is our just kind of like catch all variety show where we talk about movies and TV and a bunch of other random stuff, video games sometimes. Uh, Our episode last week was on the film In Bruges. We had our friend Michael come on and the three of us talked about that movie, uh, which is a movie all three of us love quite a bit. And I think it was a really fun conversation. Yeah, I had a great time with that. Um, Additionally, this week, uh, there will be another episode of The Doofcast dropping on the the film the ring uh the the horror movie Mm -hmm. um and this is part of our continuing deep dive into the films of gore verbinski uh, which we have we have done um three yeah this is number three yeah yeah it's number three so so yeah a lot of a lot of fun stuff happening over there yeah it's a it's a very fun show if you like this you'll probably like that it's just movies instead of books um and maybe not quite as as a deep level a a higher level conversation but we've already recorded our episode on the ring this week and i think y'all are gonna like that conversation a lot i had a lot of fun doing it yeah me too me too one more quick thing we also do a book club we do a like a, a monthly digital book club it's one of those things where again if you like what you're hearing right now probably gonna like the book club as well we let our patrons pick a new book every month then we read it we get together on youtube live on the last friday of the month and talk about that book for a couple of hours um just kind of dive into a lot of what we're doing with these books what is the book saying how is it saying it why is it saying it um why is it good or why is it bad um it's a lot of fun we get to interact with our audience in really fun ways so you guys should check that out there's still time to read the book uh we're not meeting until next friday so you still got a little over a week to read the book this month's book is old man's war by john scalzi um it's not that long of a book so should be able to get it read it and uh, and join us on Friday night to talk about it. Yeah. And, you know, even if you're not into Old Man's War, we've covered a lot of classics of sci-fi and fantasy and so forth. So you, if you just kind of look back through the backlog of the Doofcast, you'll see uh, a great number. I think I think we've done like over 20 months of books. Um, Matt, Matt, we've done over 40 months of books. That's not possible. <laughs> 
This is way <laughs> off. 40 books. I, I haven't even read 40 books in my life, Scott. <laughs> Apparently, we've done 40 books on the book club. So, um, you know, if you want to hear us talk about some other books that are not necessarily Stephen King. We um, did. I mean, I think our second book club ever was Carrie. Yeah, that's true. So that was it was before we had a Stephen King show even on the horizon. That's uh, true. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. So those are just some things that if you enjoy this, we think you'll enjoy that as well. So, uh, yeah, you can search the Doofcast in any of your podcatchers or just head on over to our website, doofmedia.com, and you'll see both the book club and the Doofcast. And also you can subscribe to our YouTube, which is where those live streams of the book club come. So yeah. we'll stop plugging our other stuff and we'll get into the reason y'all are here. But we just wanted to do that at the top because uh, we think y'all will like that stuff. Yeah. Thanks for your patience with that. Yeah. All right, Matt, let's get into it. Let's talk about chapter three, the lot one. <laughs> as its name implies chapter three doesn't focus on just one character but a whole town's worth uh a lot of them mm -hmm. you see see what i did it's, there well i think i mean that's great i think maybe king was also doing that where it's like it's the lot of them you yeah. Know? yeah yeah he's definitely doing that yeah. yeah i i have never said an original thing in my my body everything <laughs> everything on the show i'm taking from steven uh, that's that's fine <laughs> uh there's nothing new under the sun yeah I think as we kind of alluded to in the introduction of the show, I'm so happy we get to talk about this. I think this is a phenomenal achievement and sets the standard for who and what Stephen King is as a person and a writer. Um, I, I think it is amazing, you know, once again, to circle back to the idea that this is his second book, right? This is his second book. And this is, this is to me, this chapter is who Stephen King is. This, this ability to say, okay, here we go. I'm going to I, I've now given you the environment of the town. I've kind of given you the tone of the town. And now I'm going to flesh out the town with the people. It's as if Stephen King is literally playing God in, in Genesis. And on the third day, I'm going to create the people. And that's what he does here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's Carrie is obviously a great book, but it, it is an it is a small book. And I, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's it's just the, the scope of what it's trying to do is is sort of narrowly focused at, at you know a very specific kind of theme and and mm -hmm. character and um and he executes it very well but but it's nothing like this where where he really takes advantage of his ability to just sprawl but but sprawl in a way that's successful and, and detailed yeah and makes the whole setting feel like incredibly rich uh and th this is going to be a thing that he just continues to do forever but he's you know I, I guess it's just interesting to me how I don't know if I would have guessed that like Stephen King could do this just by reading Carrie, but he's apparently already kind of, you know, are already there. He's already there in terms of his abilities. Yeah, it's remarkable. And it's it's like just his ability, like a whole town's worth of people in an instant. And I, I, the way you're absolutely right that this is a sprawl of a chapter. And it is interesting to me the way he's sprawling through this town and we're making we're defining characters we're fleshing out the town we're adding faces to the things we understand and we're also we are still moving the plot forward like this is not a chapter that doesn't do anything with the plot the 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 overarching plot the overarching narrative conflict is still moving forward both on the antagonist and the protagonist side and i think it's really fascinating the ways in which he weaves those in through these sprawling let's meet the residents of salem's lot because it's it's not every single little vignette that advances the plot directly, but they are like mixed in there. They're mixed in there. And also I think he's, he's showing us more of those fault lines as yeah. we're going to get into, which is sort of a way of saying we're introducing new um, plot threads. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, so I, I guess I just wanted to sort of contextualize that. Like, it's not like Stephen King innovated the idea of, having a whole bunch of minor characters. No, no, like no. He's not the first person to try to do this sort of thing. But it's the fact that he just absolutely nails it to the extent that he makes it look easy. Mm -hmm. And like, there, there are just paragraphs, I think, that we're going to read today where it's just like, that's just a perfect paragraph. And and, and he, he just rattles off like several of them. Yeah. Um, I feel like we, uh, uh, man, I, I think I'm going to unavoidably have to like put in some broadsides toward uh straub's ghost story um <laughs> not because i like disliked that book but because like what king is doing here is very similar to what straub is doing except i just think king is so much more successful at it and efficient i think king yeah. does in 60 pages here what peter straub takes 250 to do i agree unfortunately um, and it's it's not i mean 
that's fine. Like I, you're right. I, I loved Ghost Story a whole whole lot. Um, it's one of the, the, the my favorite books I've read this year. But it is like it, it's so weird that Salem's Lot is a sprawl of a book too. It, it is a it is a long book. It is kind of a slow burn. We are 120 pages into the book after this week, and we have not met a vampire yet. Um, that our, our protagonist is not even aware that vampires exist in this in this town yet. Um, and we're already about a fifth of the way through the book maybe yeah. more so like it's not that this book is is like has a breakneck pace it just feels like we're doing so much more in the limited space that we have mm-hmm. um it, it, it's it's just remarkable in that regard and I think, yeah i think he's also making sure that the stakes that we care about are the human stakes so that when we start to have stakes through hearts um <laughs> then we'll keep our attention where it belongs which is on the characters and not on like the supernatural stuff i mean i'm yeah. sure that's going to be cool when we get there but um he, he's making yeah. sure we're very solidly rooted first i mean isn't it awesome like i know you're not there yet but just imagining what the the presence of a vampire will do in this town that you now feel like you know a little mm-hmm. bit and and know the ways in which everyone's interconnected with everyone and that's i mean there's so many different small things he's doing throughout these vignettes that are just remarkable to me and and they do i mean th- that's the thing is you haven't seen it yet but i can tell you with utmost confidence that they will enhance the central narrative conflict even if they're not directly related to it mm-hmm. sure uh, yeah yeah that, that, that makes sense to me yeah all right um so our chapter starts with this The town is not slow to wake. Chores won't wait. Even while the edge of the sun lies below the horizon and darkness is on the land, activity has begun. And I I love this little vignette here. It's the smallest one. And I think it it begins a trend that I think King does again and again, which he's playing with words a lot. I think he's having a lot of fun in this chapter, um, playing with words and winking at us. I think in our season finale of, of season one, you described King as like, you know, sitting at a bar with you talking and, and and telling a story to you and like loving messing with you and playing with you. And, and I, I, it's so evident here um, yeah. with, with like the, what he does, these, these concepts of darkness, these concepts of, of the sun and how that relates to, I mean, maybe he's making the assumption that you kind of know there's some vampire shit going on here, but just like it, it all sets this mood and this dread. And it's also winking at you a lot. Yeah, I mean the, the the phrase "darkness is on the land." Mm-hmm. Um, it has the literal meaning of like it's nighttime, but <laughs> but obviously that has the connotation of like darkness is on the land. Yeah, and so uh, definitely that. Also, you know, this isn't even this this isn't even like third person. This is just narration. Yeah, <laughs> this is yeah. just like this is what's going on in the town, and and, and you know it, it has that kind of like distant. The whole thing has a sort of well, not the whole thing. This in particular has a sort of distant, like anthropological feel to it. I'm kind of reminded of Roland, uh, who who listens to th- to stories like an anthropologist, where oh, yeah. you kind of imagine that that Stephen King slash our floating narrator is is kind of flitting around the town, observing these characters in a sort of dispassionate way, and you know, marking down their their um, their flaws and their virtues mm-hmm. with equal dispassion and relating them to us um i don't know i don't know if you you get that feeling at all but i i, I kind of get that vibe yeah i mean I, I didn't think i had in my mind put that word to it but i think you're you're absolutely onto something there there is it's a it's a study we are mm-hmm. studying the town of salem's lot and because the town of salem's lot is so important to what king is saying with this story I think that we've already established that this is talking a lot about the concept of small towns and nostalgia and and the the the, uh, the concept of change and growth and and how this town does or does not represent these things. Um, it's very important that you understand all these people um, and, and and observe them. Yeah, I think you're. Mm-hmm. I, I like that. I like cool. that a lot. All right, so we begin at four a.m which is when I woke up this morning, so I, I feel for these two. Um, we begin the day with the dairy farmers, two boys, Hal and Jack. They're beginning their morning milking. And I think the trick to what King is doing with these hyperfast characterizations that we're going to talk about for the rest of the day is that he gives each point of view character like an easily identifiable archetype and broad character trait. 
he doesn't have to get too detailed with it, but our understanding of the character is anchored in this archetype and this trait. So here with with the character of Hal, we get an 18 year old who hates school, sees no value in in it because it has nothing to do with his life of dairy farming and he wants to quit, but his dad won't let him. And so King tosses in another 14 year old brother who clearly loves school and book learning. So we've got this core understanding of this character and this core resentment at the, the core of of these characters. Mm hmm. Yeah, and and conflict and and uh, 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 interesting multiple sides to a character. Yeah, yeah, and I and I love the way he describes his his dad here. His father was a great one to sling all that bullshit about the wonders of education. Him and his sixth grade education. He never read anything but Reader's Digest, and the farm was making sixteen thousand a year. No people be able to shake their hands and ask their wives by name. Well, Hal knew people. There were two kinds: those you could push around, and those you couldn't. The former outnumbered the latter ten to one. Unfortunately, his father was a one. <laughs> I love the the idea that like, I know it was the 70s, but even still, you can kind of get the idea that Hal looks at $16,000 a year as like a huge, rich haul and yeah. like a sign of an extremely successful, prosperous business. I think he sees it as a prosperous business and I think that he looks up to his father like the, mm -hmm. the thing that you read between the lines here or at least I do is he sees his father as as like a a a, a guy who's good with people a guy who's smart who's good with money who can't be pushed around like he sees his father as very admirable but he has that sort of 18 year olds um desire to, to to you know just feeling of chafing at the restrictions so, so yeah. there's there's a fun that this is you know um th this is the first character we're looking at and i'm already sort of seeing the thing that i think i'm gonna gonna have to point out over and over which is like there's a fun uh tension at the core of the character where mm -hmm. where it's it seems like he he respects his father maybe kind of wants to be like his father but yet there is a conflict with his father because his father won't let him do what he wants to do. Very realistic. It's, it's, it's very relatable. It's the sort of thing you can imagine a young man thinking, or maybe you even thought something similar. There's, yeah. there's frustration bundled up with admiration. I, I love this idea. This idea at the core of this whole interaction is there's a father who wants his son to be better than he was. Yeah. And there's a son who just wants to be exactly like his father. Right. Right. And, and that is, I mean that's so understandable and relatable, and, and but and, but it's it's established so quickly here. Yeah, and I think one another interesting thing that King's doing is like he none of these characters are really like the straight archetype you would expect. Like mm -hmm. like I think maybe when you start reading this this character's uh, chapter or text or whatever whatever word section. Uh, you think maybe we're going to get like, okay, this is the teenager who's like, my dad's making me go to school. This sucks. What does he know? He's an ignorant fool. That's kind of how it starts. Mm -hmm. But then you, but then it swerves into, no, he's not an ignorant fool. M my dad is clearly successful without school and I want to be like him. And that's already more complex um, and, and, and like admirable and like relatable. Yeah. Um, so, so King keeps, he's going to keep doing this where he kind of, there is an archetype that he's aiming at, but then he plays around with it. He finds a way to give each archetype something lovable or relatable or pitiable or just simply human um, about that character that really makes them become three dimensional in your mind rather than just the one dimensional archetype that you were expecting. Yeah. And I think that's really important because I think I don't think Stephen King hates small towns. Like I think he has very uh, negative things to say about what what small towns can be but i don't think he's setting out in the story to like make fun of small towns and small town folk you know like mm -hmm. that's where he came from and so there is this very interesting love and hate relationship here where you can tell he has a deep amount of affection for these people even the ones that do horrible things mm -hmm. and and so there is this this conflict at the heart of all these characters that that being a small town character in, in this town makes you simultaneously a, a good, admirable person and also kind of a scumbag <laughs> at the same time. And and I love that ambiguity and yeah. that that tension. I think this is just how he sees human beings where we're, yeah. we're both capable of like amazing, beautiful acts of, of heroism and selfness, selflessness and goodness. And we're also capable of being pieces of shit. Sure. And, and one person may 
somehow be both of those things at the same time. Um, and a town is nothing more than a collection of people. And so, yeah. so yeah, I, I think that's just his, his sort of, his sort of particular brand of humanism. Yeah. I, I just think there's another author who would maybe set out to do a similar goal he has with this examination of small town life and be much more cruel in their depiction. And, and it, which is not to say that he has like glowing good things to say about Salem's lot. I think it's very clear he doesn't think Salem's lot is great, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think it's important to him to show the humanity behind all these people. I think it's, it's a long time since I read needful things, but I feel like needful things was like actively more mocking and derisive toward its characters than this book has been. It's been like yeah. 20 years since I read that book. So I don't really, certainly don't really to some of them. I mean, I think, I think it, it, it's interesting because it's doing a similar thing, but it's also doing a very different thing. That right. book is like it is trying to it's trying to show how specifically how the conflict lines between people can be uh, excavated in extremely violent ways. Right. Um, right. But it, I, all, all in all, this this feels a lot more like human and less like we're we're it, it feels different to me. Sure. It does feel different to me. Yeah. Sure. Um, also, I just want to point out something here that I will try to point out in each and every one of these little vignettes. The way King is having a lot of fun with words. I mean, look at look at the way he ends this one. The next nine months stretched ahead of him, ahead of him like an endless tomb. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, he he knows what he's doing there. He knows what he's doing. And like, it's it's sort of it's sort of funny. Just yeah, just just on the surface where it's like, what an overdramatic thought that a young man would totally have like, like mm -hmm. oh, so, oh dear sweet Jesus God, I'm going to have to be in school for nine months. Please <laughs> kill me. It's an endless tomb. It's it, you're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You kind of roll your eyes. Right. But yeah, but, but again, relatable and, and human. Yeah. You know, it also lives in an endless tomb. A vampire. That's right. And <laughs> so, okay. I was going to save this to later, but I wonder, I don't see, I, I don't know what, I don't remember much of what Callahan told us. Mm -hmm. But my suspicion is that some of these people are going to become vampires. Like they're not all just prey. And so I'm sort of, I was trying to pay attention this week and be like, is he giving us clues as to like, which of them are going to be turned against the other townsfolk or mm -hmm. am, am, am I overthinking it? I don't want an answer. Obviously I'm just like, th these are the sorts of questions I'm asking at this. Yeah. Point. I mean, all I'll tell you is I had a very similar thought this time reading through it and did a lot of research to see whether or not my thought was proved out. Um, and I won't tell you, um, <laughs> I mean, some of the stuff I don't remember, it, it has been quite a while since I read this book. So, well, maybe it'll come up again in a few weeks. Sure. All right. We accelerate to four 30 in the morning and we move over to the town milkman, which is a quaint and now non-existent vocation. Uh -huh. There's no, there's no milkman's anymore, Matt. Um, but here we have Irwin Purrington. How how good are these names? Side, side, just a general side note, like the names of these characters are so good. Puritan, they're the best. They're the best thing ever. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to make a, a, another ghost story comparison. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I couldn't remember those characters' names even after we finished the whole book. And uh, 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 yeah, that that's that's not good. Um, and, and that's because their names are all like James Johnson. And you're just like, Jesus, mm -hmm. give me something to hang on to. Erwin Purinton is, is the best <laughs> name. And and like you can sort of even mentally connect it to being like the milkman because it's like he's selling very pure milk or something mm -hmm. like, like mm -hmm. you're you kind of make an automatic mnemonic or at least I kind of did. Um, but yeah, no, it's a great it's got a great, you know, Erwin Purinton. It's got all these little new new sounds in it. Um, just, it's just great. I love it. I also think giving your characters nicknames helps your brain remember them better. Like mm -hmm. the fact that his name is Win, like he's he's Irwin, but he goes by Win. Yeah. I think for whatever reason, for me, helps my mind link that per that name to that person. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So Win himself has a, a couple of our our archetypal character traits, but the most central one is that he's a complainer. He's coming up on retirement and ready to be done with this life, and and. And the idea that he has to walk all the way back up to his truck to get some extra sour cream for the Nortons really bugs him. He says it's going to ruin his day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one common trend we'll see a lot in the, in the residents of the lot is that they kind of suck. Uh -huh. but like, like we were talking about in very human ways. 
uh, this guy, like in the 30 seconds we're with him, talks about like, uh, I'm so glad my wife is dead. <laughs> uh huh. And I can't wait to retire with my dog. Luckily, my wife's not with me. Um, yeah. Which is really fascinating. But I mean, like also just the idea, like the the most common one is that he's whining about having to go back out to his truck to get more stuff. Like we see it here. We see it uh, a little bit later with, when we, he interacts with with Eva Miller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He, he's lazy, but in that way that we're all lazy. Yeah. Like like because we can all relate to like realizing you left the lid off of the garbage can or whatever and and your reaction is like oh god it, yeah. like it's the most minor thing in the world but like but like you don't want to do it you know like i don't know that th th that's the thing is like i had a hard time disliking this guy um mm -hmm. e even though king gives us a few a few little notes of like huh he's he uh i'll, I'll bet he's fun at parties you know yeah um but uh yeah he, he's he's kind of middle of the road yeah, I mean, I think it's very easy to like armchair, like nitpick at his his laziness, but I totally agree. I mean, it's like when you get up to go into the other room and sit down on the couch and realize you've forgotten something that you needed. Yeah. And it's like it's it's the most easy <laughs> solvable problem. But also you're just like, fuck, I don't want to go get that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But because he's a fictional character, it's it's like super, you know, in your face, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, I, I don't know, like, like it's, it's made into like a really salient char character trait because this is what King is choosing to show us is like, he's, he's lazy. Yeah. So, And then of course I have to point out this, uh, he's talking about how excited he is about retirement and he says he planned to sleep until nine o'clock every day and never look at another sunrise. <sighs> yep. G get it. Um, I mean, this is one character I'm just going to go ahead and predict he becomes a vampire <laughs> <laughs> based on that. It's a lot of fun, right? Because it, it makes perfect sense that like as as a milkman, his whole life, obviously we see it, it's 4.30 in the morning. He's up doing his job. His life is just early, early mornings. And so he probably looks at a sunrise every day. So like for me, retirement would mean oh, I'm going to get to just enjoy the sunrise <laughs> yeah. for this guy. No. Uh -huh. Well, and he's already used to taking the living fluid out of a creature. And, oh, Jesus Christ, and, Matt. And, 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 <laughs> consuming it so come on actually that would apply more to the 18 year old boy wouldn't it? yeah yeah i mean but but, but that's be, ridiculous but this Matt. but the but it begins with an analogy to or a, a direct a direct comparison slash connection to people milking an animal for its warm bodily fluids which they are going then going to drink for their sustenance you don't think stephen king did that on purpose <laughs> i mean sure you don't think I, I'm, I'm sure the thought crossed his mind i don't know if he was like pivoting his story around that this idea this is gonna be like the eggs thing in ward where you make fun <laughs> of me and then you realize that milk just keeps showing up in the story over and over and then, <sighs> then you realize i'm right we're I gonna have eggs and milk it's gonna be a full continental breakfast by the time we're done i don't i'm not happy about this but yes <laughs> i guess if you squint milking a cow is kind of like being a vampire sure matt you're damn right all right <laughs> we move to 515 and we meet eva miller who is the proprietress of the boarding house that our protagonist ben mears is currently staying at her archetype here seems to be that she's she's big uh -huh. she was a big woman but not precisely fat she worked too hard at keeping her place to ever be fat the curves of her body were heroic rabelaisian Watching her in motion at her eight-burner electric stove was like watching the restless movements of the tide or the migration of sand dunes. I, I love, like, only Stephen King would describe a woman as as Rabelaisian. Like, that's fucking amazing. <laughs> that's great, yeah. Uh, once again, kind of archetype of an overweight, provincial, narrow-minded, small-town denizen. But then, no, it's not just that. She's also yeah. like a dynamo of energy. She's a force of nature. She's admirable. She's powerful. She, she's sort of like almost more than human in some ways. Yeah. Um. So we're, we're never we're never just letting it lie as just like what you kind of expected to find. Yeah. I mean, this is a woman who, yeah, like is, is established immediately as a hardworking. Yes, she's big, but she runs this place and – and she's had a hard life and I, I, I love it. Like I, she's, 
she's such a fascinating character. And I mean, this is the first of our vignettes here that have specifically touched on our main character here because Eva is at least in the orbit of Ben Mir. So we're kind of seeing a transition here. And I kind of love how King handles this. Like we start with the milk makers, then we go to the milk man and then the milk drinker. There's like a sense of natural progression as we're moving through the day. It's not just, we're not just randomly hopping around. Yeah, we're following the life cycle of this vampiric fluid that the humans are extracting from the cows. But then we leave. Oh, no, we don't. Because the next chapter goes directly to another milk connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah, I'm still right. (laughs) Yeah, we move to 605, which is, uh, I guess, we meet Sandy McDougal, who is a 17-year-old girl who has a baby. And uh, she, poor Randy McDougal is up and screaming at 605, which, I'm sorry, Sandy, but... 605 is pretty good yeah i i was up i was up at four so i don't i don't see you complaining here but poor randy mcdougall <laughs> has covered himself with shit and is screaming his head off uh who, is, it, who among us has not discovered a baby with a midnight diaper malfunction yeah i mean this is this is the uh, the section of this chapter that spoke the most to me <laughs> right now obviously because i am currently living with an infant and it, it's it's fascinating it's horrifying, right? But it's also like a hundred percent relatable. If you have ever had an infant, it's so relatable. Like yeah. I love this line here. She got Randy's bottle out of the refrigerator, thought about warming it, then thought to hell with it. If you want it so bad, Buster, you can just drink it cold. Which, yeah, um, it takes forever to warm a bottle sometimes. And mm-hmm. when the baby's screaming at you, the last thing you want to do is say, Okay, just wait five minutes. Right. Uh, obviously it's a bad idea because if you try to feed my son cold milk he will like just pitch a fit and also puke all over you and it will be terrible so right bad 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 yeah they they will act like you're trying to kill them with with the cold milk yeah but of course beyond just feeding the baby cold milk she then um throws the bottle at its head which uh ow (laughs) and then punches the shit out of him until his eyes swell shut uh, I love this line, though. By the time she came back with a wet ra- rag, both of Randy's eyes has swelled shut and were discoloring. But he took the bottle when she began to wipe his face with the damp rag. He smiled toothlessly at her, which is just like the immediate forgiveness of of infants. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this is like I think this is King. This is what King does best, which is where he taps into. OK, I'm going to preface this with the fact that I would never hurt my child. Uh-huh. Uh, like the last thing in my mind is ever hurting my child. But sometimes at uh-huh. three o'clock in the morning, when your baby just won't stop screaming, you get a little frustrated. Uh-huh. And and I think that King acknowledges this fact while, while also saying it's horrifying that she actually inflicted violence on this child. It's so human to at least imagine yourself doing these things. Yeah. Or, or to just feel like incredible an, frustration an unreasonable insane level of frustration with with the baby yeah um i mean any parent who says they've never felt like sort of insane level with of frustration due to a combination of sleep deprivation and you know especially like if you've had like a colicky baby or a baby that yeah. doesn't sleep well or or um or even just, you know, a, a healthy baby, I think, can push your buttons pretty well. Yeah. I um, mean, my, my son is wonderful. He is I, – I don't have a lot to compare it to, but he's a wonderful baby. And he still annoys the shit out of me sometimes. And this is like – again, I want to preface this with I would never <laughs> hurt my child, right? But like before I had the baby, there you go through all these like meetings and like trainings and stuff to learn. And the one thing they say over and over again is like – if you get frustrated, you know, put the baby down. Do not shake the baby. Like shaking baby syndrome is a, is a serious thing. And the pre-parent you is like, c- come on. Like that's not that's not ever going to happen. Like there, there's there's not even going to be a time where I feel like that could happen, that I'd get that frustrated. And then you actually yeah. have well, the kid. Th- th- that's, that's because non-sleep deprived you has no real insight into how sleep deprived you will actually behave yeah because sleep deprived you is not really the same human Mm -hmm. um and so there is i mean for me as a parent of of multiple kids there's a lot of uh compassion even though sandy obviously does a terrible thing like she does an objectively terrible thing oh it's awful Um, it's 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 horrifying it's the the part that you relate to is yeah okay we've all kind of felt that way and also she's 17 life has dealt her a rough hand she's not 
exactly living the dream here, mm-hmm. there are some mitigating circumstances. So, so, so again, there's like, you've got a bunch of ticks in the pros column and a bunch of ticks in the cons column, and you're not really sure how to balance that. It leaves you with a very ambiguous feeling about the character. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. And I think that's, that's so fascinating because yeah, she, she throws a bottle at the head of her kid and then mm-hmm. punches him. Like she punches a baby in the face. I can't imagine punching a baby in the face. What it would, ugh, that horrifies me. But yeah, I, I, I love that. I mean, I will say <laughs> just as a side note that uh, Stephen King's second child was born in 1972. So about the time he was writing this book, uh-huh. he would have had a, a very small child. So I wonder if Joe Hill ever went back and read Salem's Lot and like did the math and went like, Dad, uh, did you want to punch me? I'm did sure. you want to punch me in the face, Dad? I'm sure he did. And I'm sure Stephen King would be honest about that sort of thing too. Oh, certainly. So, He'd yeah. be like, yeah, Joe, you were, you were a pain in the ass. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right, we move over to 645 and we meet Mike Ryerson, the Salem's Lot groundskeeper, who is on his way to mow one of the three cemeteries in the lot. I think Mike is such a fascinating character. And I think this slides exactly into what you were talking about, Matt, where like he is not the archetype you would think a small town groundskeeper would be. He's an educated young man um, who completed three years of college and, and just hadn't finished quite yet. And he really enjoys his job. And he just likes being outside. He likes being his own boss. He just likes this existence. He really enjoys it. And all these other people around him are kind of horrified by like what he does. Like you work, you do cemetery stuff, you bury people. And he's like, yeah, what's wrong? What's wrong with that? Yeah. The the only thing more natural than death is sex. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's that's such a great Stephen King line. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I, I think Mike Mike seems like the most uncomplicatedly likable character, mm-hmm. um, which means he's either going to be part of our quartet or he's going to turn out to be a horrible villain. I like it. I like it. Um, and of course, we got this wonderful line here that is kind of continuing our tradition of playing with with language here. Even after 25 years, the scar of the great burning was there. Well, that was just it. In the midst of life, we are in death. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, Stephen, it's wonderful. It's great. Um, so at the cemetery gate, Mike finds a dead dog impaled on one of the spikes of the gate. And this is a really important like shift of the the momentum of the book, I think. Up until this point, we actually haven't seen anything like truly monstrous. I mean, okay, a mother punching her infant son is not great. That's terrible. But the murder and kind of display of a dog in this way is veering into like truly demented behavior. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it, it's, it's horrifying. Um, mm-hmm. It's upsetting. I mean, the King knows very well, the people love dogs. Yes. He's not at the point of in his career yet where he understands that you just absolutely should never mess with a dog. But um, uh, yeah, the, he knows what he's doing. It, mm-hmm. it was a particularly interesting thing to, to open with, I guess, because I don't really see like, killing a dog as being a thing that fits into the classic vampire story for me. So I was, I, I just wasn't quite sure how to place it in terms of like this beat, where does this beat fall in, in a vampire story? Like mm-hmm. it's definitely a horrible senseless act of cruelty and it was upsetting and everything. Um, it's just, I, I was like, is he using the dog for sustenance or is this actually just like, a sort of borderline satanic thing or maybe literally satanic thing. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't know what to make of it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it's not just the, the murder of a dog. It's the display. It's right. been spiked. It's been right. like displayed to be found and to horrify. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah. I think one of the reasons this works really well though, and what I love about this chapter in particular is everything is related to everything. King captures that small town feel through the ways in which these events and characters ping off each other. Because of course, this isn't just a dog, right? This is when Puritan's dog, the the milkman who talked about how he can't wait to retire and take his dog with him and leave this town and, and never look at a sunrise again. So only a few pages ago, he was talking about his retirement with this dog. And, and now we 
see the dog is dead. So it's not just a dead dog. It's a dead dog that with an emotional connection. And he does this again and again throughout this chapter. Like when we meet Weasel in a few moments, it won't just be here's another random character. We'll know him as Ava's tenant. This is Weasel is Ava's tenant. And we see the chains that connect each of these characters to each other. And I think that also helps with when you have this many characters you're introducing in this short of a span, it helps you file them away and place them and remember them, who they are and, and what they are and, and why they are when you see the chain they have to other characters. Yeah, I like the idea, you know, a chain or, or like a web, sure. um, yeah. which I, I think later on there will be a direct comparison made to, to like a spider's web of, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, all these nodes connecting all these characters sure. together. At eight o'clock, we meet Charlie Rhodes, bus dictator who rules his yellow school bus with an iron fist. We see that this is a man who has absolutely no problem forcing like an eight year old child to walk two miles to the elementary school if they talk on his bus. Mm -hmm. uh, what an asshole. Uh -huh. But again, I'm going to repeat myself and I think we're going to repeat ourselves a lot in this episode. I love the way King characterizes this man. It's not enough for him to just build this character as overly strict bus driver type. That he has to go further mm -hmm. and he goes further with Charlie. So we see here the, the text says the man in charge of the SAD 21 motor pool, David Felsen was an old buddy. They went all the way back to Korea together. They understood each other. They understood what was going on in the country. They understood how the kid who had been just talking a little loud on the school bus in 1958 was the kid who had been out pissing on the flag in 1968. And it's just like, I love that it's that little wrinkle. It just yeah. introduces more to it. Right. Just like with Sandy above the approach here is like, okay, the guy definitely sucks. We're going to be clear about that. You wouldn't want to hang out with him for sure. Mm -mm. But, <laughs> and then there's mitigating circumstances. It's like, okay, guys had a rough life. Guys, guys seen some shit. Um, and, yeah. and, and again, it's not like it excuses it, but Certainly you're not, not quite sure what to make of it, right? You're not quite sure like, well, okay, well, like this is the sort of guy where you can imagine when the chips are down and there's vampires, maybe you actually want the asshole who knows how to use a gun <laughs> on your side. Um, like, like maybe you're willing to overlook some, uh, some unnecessary uh, strictness with children. Um, so, so yeah, I, like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I love, I love that King is repeatedly just not giving us a comfortable place to sit with regard to these characters. Yeah. And, and I, I love that. Like, I just, I just it it reflects his desire with his storytelling because I think it's very easy when you're outlining or not even outlining just just pantsing like he does a story where you say I want to have a bus driver character and I want this bus driver character to be an asshole he's mean to the kids this is like I think every story with kids going to school has a bus driver character in it and they're usually not the greatest person right mm -hmm. this is a a, a well trod archetype of the asshole bus driver. But I need to understand him. It's not enough for me just to define him as the tyrant bus driver. I need to understand why that is. And he creates this that, – that, that sentence is such a Stephen King sentence. They understood how the kid who had been just talking a little too loud on the school bus in 1958 was the kid who had been piss, out pissing on the flag in 1968. Mm -hmm. It's just like this perfect – I get how the world works type of person um, based on my experiences. And right. And of course it's like complete bullshit. <laughs> yeah, like, of course it is. Well, like, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's like hilariously uh, unrealistic, but yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I love about this, the story is in the last chapter, King defined Salem's lot as a town in which the happenings of the world were only seen externally, right? Like they, in Salem's Lot, nothing ever changes. In Salem's Lot, they only hear about the the up unrest in the country like from the news, right? And so here's a guy who is living in Salem's Lot. Yes, he went to Korea um, in the war. Um, he's probably been here a very long time, and but he understands what's going on in the country, right? Like this is a guy who definitely would be watching Fox News if Fox News existed um, in 1975. Yeah, right. Uh, he... he yeah. <laughs> he has his own ex extremely certain opinions about what's happening in the country that are probably yeah. not correlated to what's happening in the country. Let's yeah. Say. And, and without any actual direct understanding and 
observation of what's happening in the country. Just right. a removed. I am. I understand it because I feel like I I'm right type of thing. Well, and and I mean, it may be in a sense fair that he knows more about what's happening in the in the world than the average person in the town. Sure, but only about this one particular thing that he yeah. knows about. You yeah. know. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. So at nine, we cut back to good old Weasel Craig, tenant of Ava Miller, who wakes up hungover. He wakes up to Ben Mears incessant typing, which we we learn here that Ben, uh, his schedule for writing sounds awfully familiar to a certain author. <laughs> uh, the named Stephen King. Uh-huh. Uh, so we learn here that Weasel is a poor alcoholic freeloader who pays for his room and board through favors with Eva. Um, I, th- what do you think of this character? What do you think of Weasel? Um, well, first of all, Weasel being the name that everybody calls him is so good. And of course, of course that makes him immediately memorable. Speaking of like nicknames, mm-hmm. um, you're just like, yeah, you're not going to forget Weasel. Nope. Um, it, and what also we don't learn why he's called Weasel. We just learn nope. that's what everybody calls him. Um, maybe we'll find out, maybe not. Um, but, uh, yeah, Weasel's, Weasel's great. Love Weasel. And, uh, we learned that, that. Eva and Weasel used to be in a sexual relationship Uh and it's one that Weasel really still wishes was happening. But at least from our perspective, we haven't seen anything from her that would seem that that's something she wants to rekindle at all. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it. Although there's definitely some sort of tension between them still. Sure. I don't know. I mean, she's keeping him close by, right? She's keeping him close by. Like, I'm not sure what the nature, like it's possible that she does like him, but she feels bad about you know she feels some sort of obligation to her husband or something i don't know we mm-hmm. i i feel like there are seeds being planted here and we're not really meant to know quite what direction they're going to grow in yet mm-hmm. um also just wanted to focus on this wonderful line of stephen king's again where he's he's thinking longingly about his sexual relationship with eva and then we end the section with he began to polish the banister again with long sweeping strokes <laughs> We thought we left Horny King behind, Matt, but he's Ugh. he's back. Horny King is back. Horny King, you never lose Horny King. <laughs> um, I, I I don't remember the exact line, but I love the line where like he looks in the mirror and it's like his 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 long white hair was the only part of him that seemed to respond well to to the alcohol. Yeah, um, yeah. So we have another alcoholic character. Um, mm-hmm. I think probably not even the only one we're going to meet this week. Uh, uh nope. But um. Yeah, it's it's great. It's interesting. Like again, it's a middle ground. There's a violation of expectations. Like he wakes up hungover, and that sort of suggests, like, okay, well, here's another guy that you're not going to like. But then he's actually he seems okay. Like beyond that initial beat of like he woke up hungover because he was drinking, and any uh, and and he doesn't like Ben Mears because Ben Mears is, works too much. Um, but but yeah, like there's this there's this question mark that I felt was hanging over everything in his chapter, in his section, because it seems like maybe like the reason he sticks around has more to do with the fact that he wants Eva's attention than that. He needs the the place to live, you know, like, yeah. like he wants, like, like he's hoping that'll, that'll open up again. And you can see that things could go badly if like if if like he kind of goes forward and she rejects him or you could see this becoming a romance subplot if she if she, that is what she wants. Like there's there's a lot of sort of built in tension in this dynamic. Well, and I love that, like you're right that he's like the alcoholic, like um, mess of a character, but he gets up, he checks what the day is. Is it my uh, my unemployment day? No. Oh, it's Wednesday. It's the day I have to help. Eva and mm-hmm. like like the the idea of he gets up and he has his morning breakfast one is a, a warm beer and the two is the oatmeal that he doesn't actually like he doesn't like oatmeal but he's going to go down and eat his oatmeal because he knows there's chores to do mm-hmm. and so he's like fueling himself and maybe giving himself a reason to be down in the kitchen with her mm-hmm. um, so so he'll be around for her to order and yeah yeah it's 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 really adorable I mean the majority of Weasel's chapter here or the section of the chapter is completely taken up about talking about her like we get her husband's ralph we get his whole backstory through weasel's chapter because all he's thinking about is eva um so we learn that poor ralph uh like is hero of the sawmill that saved it from the fire of 51 but then uh nine years later fell into uh 
uh, a working saw and, and died mm-hmm. uh, horribly. Um, and I, but it just demonstrates to me how much of Weevil, Weasel's life revolves around this woman completely. Right. Yeah, I mean th- that's th- that's kind of the thing is I'm not sure like this this will be fun to come back and listen to in like a year when I know the answers to all these things. I'm really not <laughs> sure if this is being set up as like he has an unhealthy obsession with her or just like he's in love with her and maybe that is going to be a positive thing. Um, sure. Not really sure yet. Sure. Then we go to 10 o'clock and head to school where we meet Richie Bodden, the playground bully, and Mark Petrie, his his target who absolutely wrecks his ass oh, in a fight. God, just so, <laughs> such a wonderful scene. So, so satisfying. Isn't it? Oh my gosh. I, I adore this. Like, I love I, I love and have always loved, and it's something that you haven't got to experience very much of, but I love the way Stephen King writes bullies. They're some of the most nasty people ever, but he always writes them with this central core of insecurity. And I think this guy, Richie Bodden, is no exception. Like, I love this line here. Richie was 11 years old and weighed 140 pounds. All his life, his mother had been calling on people to see what a huge young man her son was, and so he knew he was big. Sometimes he fancied that he could feel the ground tremble underneath his feet when he walked. And when he grew up, he was going to smoke camels, just like his old man. So, like, he's a bully and a jerk, sure. But he's still also 11 years old. Uh And so he's still kind of a child, right? And and I think King understands this because, like, the idea of, like, yeah, his mommy calls him big. And so, like, he, he it's become core to his identity that he's large because that's, like, the thing his mother always is talking about. Yeah. And he also, like, can't wait to grow up and be just like his dad because he's a little kid. Like, this is kind of tying back to our our, our uh, milkman earlier right. in, the, in the chapter as well. Yeah. I, I mean, you definitely don't like Richie, but he he, he feels human to you. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, I, th- I feel like this... um this interlude is just as much about Mark as it is about Richie, you know? Yeah. Like I, I, we even spend some time in Mark's head because we get the sense that Mark has, you know, seen some shit where, you know, he, he's, he, he thinks to himself at one point, something like in a street situation, this is what I would do, mm-hmm. but this is not a street situation. This is this context. And, and, and it's like all of this fl- fl- went through his head in a, in a sixth of a second. And then he just reacted and it's like, okay, it's not his first rodeo. No. Um, and, um, and we don't really understand where, like, like it, it is indeed not actually Mark's interlude because we don't actually know where, you know, where, where does Mark come from? Why, why does he think this way? Why, why is he like this? Um, yeah but we do see enough of it to realize like, okay, this kid is different from the others. Mm -hmm. Um, He's, he's new in town. I, I mean, I sort of, I I may be missing some details here, but my first thought was like, this, is this the kid from the prologue? Um, Maybe it, I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to notice things that I'm not noticing or or whatever, but that that was my first thought. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Mark kid is clearly somebody we're supposed to be paying attention to though. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. And you picked up on exactly what you're supposed to do that while we're in the head of Richie, this kind of seems like Mark's vignette. Like, yeah. And, and I, I love, I love what you said because he does seem like it, it reminds me of like the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes fights where uh-huh. you see him like making the, observations and calculations as he's going through the fight like i have to i've knocked him down now i have to finish it because if he gets back up his his the larger size will overpower me all i had was my my surprise going right. for me like he's very intelligent he understands what his limitations are he understands what his opponent's limitations are and he navigates the the, the fight in a way that no one would expect he seems wise beyond his years yeah and he keeps a cool head in a way mm-hmm. that i think that above everything else is what communicates like this is not the first or the 10th time he has been in a situation like this. Yeah. We also, I mean, we don't see Mark Petrie anymore in this chapter, but we do learn that uh, are the two boys that, that conclude the chapter are going to see Mark. I think we see one of the boys here yeah. um, who kind of like gloms to him after a successful beating up of the bully. Um, and we get like, we get, a, I think, I think the one tiny thing we learn here is that he has like the complete set of the universal monsters action figures. And that's why the boys are so excited to go see him. So like it it lends towards more, this guy's unusual 
yeah. versus most of the people here. Right. I mean, the fact that the kid is already sort of obsessed with monsters mm-hmm. in a story about vampires like yeah. feels yeah. relevant. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's move on. We head over to 1115 a.m. and we meet the town. We go to the town dump and meet its custodian, Dud Rogers, <laughs> again, with the names here. Dud uh, Rogers. It's yes, perfect. God. Um, I love the description of Dud Rogers here as well. He was a hunchback with a curious cocked head that made him look as if God had given him a final petulant wretch before allowing him out into the world. His arms, which dangled ape-like almost to his knees, were amazingly strong. It had taken four men to load the old hardware store floor safe into their panel truck to bring it out here when the store got its new wall job. The tires of the truck had settled appreciably when they put it in, but Dud Rogers had taken it off himself cords standing out on his neck veins bulging on his forehead and forearms and biceps like blue cables he had pushed it over the east edge himself <laughs> um so here's dud rogers who's the dump guy and like any other archetypal dump archetypal dump guy he's strong and weird and yeah um and his kind of defining characteristic is that he really enjoys shooting rats uh-huh. <laughs> and likes to imagine other people in his life that annoy him as he's blowing up these rats and cackling madly. Uh So, um, that's dud Matt. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot here, huh? (laughs) I mean, so, so on the one hand, he has this unfortunate physical deformity, Mm -hmm. um, which makes him alienated from everyone else. And and I I think makes him feel, you know, alienated and outcast. Um, but he doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about that, actually. Like, like the, the text focuses on, like, actually, he's extremely physically strong, which actually kind of codes as physically dangerous mm-hmm. when we learn that he loves burning and shooting things. <laughs> um, I mean, a small perverse part of me was like, I wonder if this guy is going to turn out to be, like, extremely good and useful because he's a gunslinger. Um, <laughs> but, um but I'm not sure like that's that's I guess that's what's fun about so many of these is I'm like I could literally see this character becoming a villain or becoming part of our core you know cotet of heroes which I, I frankly I just assume is happening because it's a Stephen King story but I might be wrong um yeah no comment from you of course but uh, <laughs> I, yeah what I would you want me to say something? <laughs> no, no no but but just but just like yeah like I, I literally can't tell what direction he's going to take these characters and that that is exactly the right way to do this I think mm-hmm yeah i mean because part of you like we have these characters like it makes sense that we're learning more about eva miller she's in the proximity of our um our protagonist right like it makes sense we're going to talk about the the realtor who sells the the house to our vampire in a bit um it makes sense we're learning about those characters but then we jump over to people like uh, the 17 year old girl with the baby we jump over to people like dud and we have to ask ourselves okay what what are we doing this for? Mm-hmm. What, why, why are we doing this besides just to give ourselves more flavor of the town? Is there, is there a secondary purpose that King is, is uh, setting up with the establishment of these characters? And we don't right. have an answer to that yet, but just reading it causes us to ask the question. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So at 12 noon, we head to the longest vignette of the chapter where we meet Lawrence Crockett, who is, as we just talked about our real estate agent, um, this is also, I think the the little vignette, uh, along with being the longest is the one that is most directly related to like the central plot of the book, right? Because this is it's, how, how our antagonists come to town. Yeah. It's the only one that is a more or less straightforward flashback. Yeah. So we, we meet Crockett as he's reading a book, right? Right. As the lunch bell dings at 12 noon, uh, the book is Satan's sex slaves. So there's that. Um, uh, huh. He he puts his literature aside and heads off to lunch. On his way, he sees a car. It's the Marston place, which triggers the memory of when he sold this place to R.T. Straker a year ago. Um, I think we'll remember that that the the antique shop mentioned in the news article was called Straker and Barlow's. So that's when we kind of start to put things together a little bit here. Yeah. Um, it makes me wonder if Satan's Sex Slaves is like a real book that people in the 70s would have heard of or just a made up thing that King put in <laughs> to sort of stand in for like smut. Um, I'm disinclined to do a Google search to answer this question for some reason, but um, I do wonder. Google it. <laughs> okay. All right. Hold on. I want to see what the YouTube algorithm does. Yeah. With hold on. That information. I'm putting it in quotes. <laughs> this is live. Um, We're doing it live. 
No, I mean, you're getting a lot of hits on porn websites. Like, Shocking. Yeah, but Shocking. not no no reference to any particular book. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it was a real book. I'm going to add book, book. <laughs> this is great audio. Novel. Novel. Oh, we've moved beyond book. No, it doesn't seem like it. If it exists, then Google's failing to find it, which is very disappointing to me. Um, okay. Well, I think the important part is here <laughs> is that we see very clearly that our, our man Crockett is kind of a scumbag, you know, between the smut he's reading at work, which is just weird. It's like when I saw a guy, there was a guy on the, the train once reading Fifty Shades of Grey next to me. And it just, I don't know. It just feels weird knowing that someone's reading about banging right next to me. It's a little uncomfortable, sure. Yeah. Um. He also describes his assistant's delectable jahoobies, um, which is just just incredible word choices there. Uh-huh. I mean, like, I think that's like I think King gets like raked over the coals for some for the ways his characters like constantly describe women's breasts. But in this instance, it's 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 establishing Crockett's scumbagginess, right? Like this is a, a schemy like weasel like he maybe he should be called weasel this is not a good dude yeah yeah i mean it's focusing a lot on him just being kind of skeevy and and mm-hmm. sexually uh uh over 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 i think oversexed is yeah. the appropriate word sure <laughs> it's it's one of the most salient features of his character um until he then goes into a negotiation with the devil um <laughs> which is appropriate considering the reading material yeah yeah um yeah i think go ahead no i just think it's important we we establish this core item of his personality before we get into the shady land deals because we want to understand going into those negotiations who he is as a person and then we understand exactly why he would gladly make this deal that he knows smells bad yeah it's just a, a bunch of stuff that adds up to like slimy character yeah definitely yeah. So yeah, we see Straker, our boy, walks in. Um, so we know he's not a vampire, Matt, because it's daytime. Um, so he's vampire's assistant. Yeah. But he comes in and, and demands the Marston Bar House or Monst- Marston House and the old laundromat to open up his antique store. Uh, like we said before, it's Straker and Barlow's, uh, which is a name we've heard before. Yeah. So that was a, a year ago, right? Is, yes. Th- this flashback is occurring yeah. one year ago. Yeah. yeah. And and so and and so now the the store has been set up, but. But only, but only now is Straker apparently moving into Straker and or Barlow, I guess, moving into the house. Yeah, I mean, we see the big, the big thing that's happening, the recurring thing that's happening in this is that there's a car up at the Marston house. Mm-hmm. Like see, we've seen repairs happening at the Marston house, which we learn um, is Crockett, like that he was kind of hired to manage those. Now there's a car at the Marston house. There's a poster um, for the antique shop. Like things are moving now, and this mm-hmm. is this is important because. I guess like Crockett made this deal and then heard not a peep from Straker for almost a year to the point where he's like, ah, I, I won. And then stuff is happening now. That just yeah. so happens to be exactly when our protagonist shows up. Right, right. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, I mean, I think I picked all this up, but I wanted to clarify the, the timelines. Sure, sure. Um, all right. So yeah, this is, this is our vampire and his daywalker finding their way into the town. And I think... We see here that the way he gets his fangs into this town is through the greed of a crooked jerk like Crockett, right? And I think that's important. Um, I, th- I don't know if you remember the reporter's story in the newspaper in the prologue, but uh, Crockett was one of the people that were wanted for questioning that disappeared from the town that were wanted for questioning because of shady land deals. Um, <laughs> he was he was featured and named in that that news article i didn't remember that detail this, this is the sort of thing i do appreciate being reminded of because i should in principle be able to remember that but no i did not remember that that's what i'm here for yeah um so throughout this whole scene i kept thinking like so is this the part of the mythology where the vampire needs to be invited in like, is this the role that Crockett is serving? Is he sort of inviting him in? I mean, I, I like part part of the thing I found interesting is that Straker doesn't just like sell the land, get a bunch of cash and use the cash to buy the um the house or whatever. Mm-hmm. He he does this elaborate swaparoo and is like, I'm going to buy it for one dollar. 
And it's like, I wonder if this is all some elaborate way of, of making it so that effectively um, someone in the town is, is, is inviting him in and sort of give, you know, giving him the home in, in some sense. I just did air quotes with my fingers in case you couldn't <laughs> see that. Um, I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the kind of thing where we're ever going to find out one way or the other, but it just, it, it definitely reminded me of that part of the vampire mythos. Sure. I mean, I, I, I don't, we, yeah, we don't know enough about how vampires work in this world. I think the, the inviting in thing was not something that Per Callahan clarified for us. Mm-hmm in uh wolves of the Cala, so we don't know um i think i think at least what we can do right now is say that's a really fun metaphorical um choice yeah and an image in the story is that the vampire has to be invited in in this very specific way and so he's he's been given the stuff in this town um he, he could he didn't like it's so interesting. Like he could have just moved in. They could have just squatted in the Marston house, you know, like it's, it's central. It's for, for some reason we don't fully understand yet. It's central to their plans here that they are established in the town that right. they are, they, they are seen as legitimate owners of business and residential space right. in the town that they were sort of welcomed in and made part of the town. Not just, yes. not just, outsiders not just i mean they are outsiders but they have a they have a stake in the town i'm gonna keep using that word because it keeps being funny to me (laughs) um yeah no i i I like it i like it a lot i like i mean i think that's the fun thing about playing with these ideas is like whether or not somebody literally needs to invite them in effectively a community member has handed over the keys and let them in yes absolutely Mm -hmm. yeah um, so just Straker trades land worth four million dollars um, that will be worth more when that land is eventually uh, developed to put a mall on for the two buildings. Something I think we're told is worth about like 20 grand. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's yeah, it's one of those deals that is that King has built to be so absurd. It seems fishy and Crockett knows that mm-hmm. and yet does it anyway. Um, he's also agrees to do a series of favor favors for the vampire's assistant, right? Like some vague, like we're going to ask you to do some stuff um, and help us with repairs and just do things for us. You're going to become our slave in some ways, which is it's great. Yeah, I, I love how that element is just kind of glossed over until much later when Crockett realizes, like, wait a second, <laughs> what did I actually agree to? Uh-huh, this seems uh-huh. kind of open ended. Um, I also just want to comment on Straker and how Straker is like a great unnerving villain presence. Yeah, just, let's talk about him a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's the, the, the way he behaves is um, it, it's creepy, but also like he's clearly still like a, a man, right? Yes. Like, like, like we, it's obvious to us. This is not the vampire. This must be the familiar um, or, or something. Yeah. And, um, and like, yeah, I, I like how he he's sort of like derisive at various points. I like that, you know, he speaks with well-bred contempt. Um, <laughs> I, I like that phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, I like, yeah, I don't know. He, I, I can't wait to see more of, of Straker, actually. Um, he, yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's yeah, I, I the way King describes the way he talks, the way he holds himself, the way he comes to this whole situation. Like, I think he says something to the effect of like, um, if you if you tell anyone about this deal, I will make you pay for it. And like King describes it as like he said this with the same frankness. One talks about like um, something so super mundane. Right. Yeah, it's right. just like it's it's so flat and assured that that he he knows he can back up any threat or promise he makes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Crockett recognized this. Right. Because we're in his head. He's remembering this interaction and so he knows all this and he knows there's something fishy he knows there's something wrong with this guy he knows there's something off about this whole thing and yet he does it anyway because that's it was like designed to trap him because the greed it's it's such a good deal how can you not take this deal yeah exactly just to sort of continue in the same tenor of our conversation up to this point and you know to to be charitable to crockett like it's not like you or i in this position would be attentive to the possibility of vampire invasion <laughs> like like we would we would be like or, or you know speak for myself i would be like you know i've been around the block enough times to be alert for a scam but i can't spot the scam mm-hmm. there's, there's no scam i guess i'll run the papers by my lawyer and then the lawyer is going to see that the papers are legitimate 
And then past that point, it's like, well, what's there to object to other than just not understanding the client's motivations sure, and suspecting that something is fishy, but not being able to put your finger on it. So, so really it's like, yeah, like Crockett is probably ultimately responsible for the town being destroyed by vampires, but it's a mistake that anyone could make. Sure. Um, I think, I think we need to start to spread the word that all real estate contracts should have some sort of vampire clause. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, just to be sure. I mean, what's the harm? Yeah. You should have to see the buyer in a mirror before you (laughs) sign off. (laughs) This contract must be signed at noon in broad daylight. I mean, isn't it interesting that it is noon that this, that King chose this particular interaction to occur? I love that. Yes. That's It is the exact middle of the day. Yeah. Um, I, I love this line as well. I don't care about the townspeople. My partner doesn't care about the townspeople. The townspeople always talk. They are no different from the magpies on telephone wires. Soon they will accept us. It's just, it's wild. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's so ominous. And, but like, he knows he's right. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, he speaks of the townspeople in a way that makes it clear that there there have been many towns and many townspeople in the past we've done this whole charade before and we're gonna do it again yeah yep Yep. um i I love we we kind of jump back to the future now and with as we said mr barlow and mr straker are finally coming to town and uh we conclude this whole thing with crockett running into someone and they're having a conversation about straker seemed like a nice enough sort did he Hard to tell, Larry said, and found he wanted to lick his lips. He didn't. We only talked business. He seemed okay. When they crossed the street, Lawrence Crockett was thinking about deals with the devil. Uh Uh-huh. There you go. We begin begin and end with the devil. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, again, it's great because, like, he knows something is terribly off, but he doesn't know, like, what or how. So he just has this, like, animal sense of, like, I've made a terrible mistake and I don't but I don't know what the mistake was and I don't know how it's going to get me. Yeah. I mean, um, just like the, the, the choice to do the, he wanted to lick his lips. Mm-hmm. Like he just feels yeah, innately animalistically that yeah. something is wrong here and his body is responding automatically to that. Yeah. Well, I, it's a great question. Cause, cause like the honest answer to, you know, did striker seem like a nice enough sword is like, he seemed like a creepy a monster yeah but like but like no one would even believe me if i described how creepy he was so i'm Mm -hmm. just gonna i'm just gonna play it off yeah Yeah. also he threatened to punish me if i told anyone about our deal that too yeah which of course he is he's going to he's absolutely how can he he not he's the i mean that's the one thing they've established in him he's the type of guy that like needs other people to know about it going to tell them and then somebody's going to yeah that's one thing is i don't really i don't know how much to expect like straker versus barlow to be um the main villain like obviously okay i say obviously i don't know anything right but like (laughs) but like obviously barlow is the vampire straker is the familiar but like that Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that straker isn't also going to be a very active antagonist sure so i I just don't know what exactly to expect okay Um, yeah All right, we head to 1 o'clock p.m. and we meet up with with our girl Susan Norton, who's going to Babs Beauty Boutique. Um, Babs, of course, is the sister of Hal and Jack, the dairy farmer boy. So once again, we see here, Matt, that everything is connected to everything because it's a small town Mm -hmm. and we can't go anywhere in this town without someone being related back to someone we've met previously. Mm -hmm. It's a web. Um, Susan is there to get her hair all done up because she's got her her dinner with uh, Ben Mears tonight. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I really love this quote in here. And Babs asked Susan if she had seen that some folks were opening up a new furniture store in the old village wash tub. Expensive stuff by the look, but wouldn't it be nice if they had a little hurricane lamp to match the one that she had in her apartment and getting away from home and living in town was the smartest move she'd ever made. And hadn't it been a nice summer? It seemed like a shame it ever had to end. Yeah, it's great. I love, I love Babs. I'm glad Babs is going to be totally okay. Totally okay. Um, I like that that paragraph there because it's like it's rushed like Babs is just talking, talking away. Like, I think that's something King says is that Babs is just incessantly talking like hairdressers tend to. Yeah. 
Right. Um, and the way King writes that is like one sentence just bleeds into another. Like they're separate sentences, but like the way they're written, they just run. It feels like a run on. Yeah, um, sure. It feels like this, like, like we see here expensive stuff by the look, but wouldn't it be nice if they had a little hurricane lamp to match the one she had in her apartment and getting away from home and living in town was the smartest move she'd ever made. Like that, that moves one to another and hadn't been a nice summer. We have three entirely <laughs> separate thoughts there in one sentence. Yeah. Um, and just perfectly. Right. Like King knows what he's doing yeah. here. We got this bubbly, lovable character mm-hmm. and sort sort of the most uncomplicated of the characters in the whole uh, uh, chapter so far. Yep. Yep. At three o'clock BM, PM, we witness an affair between a middle aged Bonnie Sawyer and Corey Bryant. There's not much to say about this one here, Matt. Um, we don't we don't know any of these characters. And this is another one we go, OK, why? Why did why did we do this? Yeah, <laughs> but. I mean, the important thing to say, though, is to circle back around to what you talked about last week was that the large thing of what this chapter and what the book has kind of done so far largely is defining our lines of conflict, lines of conflict that snake all over town because everything's connected via your web um, and and could threaten to destroy everything. And so here's here we have another one. We have we have Bonnie Sawyer having an affair with a younger man. Um, it's it's firmly established in this chapter that if Bonnie's husband were to find out about this affair, he would not react well. I think she just says, he says, am I too early? And she said, no, if you were, you would have a hole in you because yeah. my husband would be here. So like very clear conflict set up here. Yep. Yep. I mean, so, so number one, it's been several pages since we did anything related to sex. So thankfully, uh, here we are. Horny um, King. That's right. Uh, and yeah, this seems like an explosive situation. Like mm-hmm. even Bryant seems aware of this. Um, he's not an idiot. He just can't help himself. Like, I, I guess, I mean, maybe he is an idiot, but, but the point is like, he's totally aware of the danger, but he's like a rat hypnotized by a serpent. He's like, he's just going to keep coming back until he gets shot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is definitely one of those like planting a little land mine here for us to stumble upon later narratively. Sure, sure. At 4 p.m., we briefly reconnect with our protagonist, Ben Mears. He is done writing for the day, or at least for the moment. He'll come back and write after his dinner. Uh, And really in this section, all he does is do what he does best, which is look ominously up at the Marsden house. Mm -hmm. Um, I love this this quote here. From here, it was a perfect miniature, diminished to the sides of a child's dollhouse. And he liked it that way. From here, the Marsden house was a size that could be coped with. You could hold up your hand and blot it out with your palm. That's great. Yeah. Yet, yet again, he acknowledges the thing of dread, but he's oh so slow and deliberate in how he approaches it. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of reminds me of how I watched The Ring the other night, and, <laughs> where, where I kind of kind of approached it at arm's length, and then I immediately read a bunch of inane trivia about it to make it no longer scary. Very, very good. So maybe uh, maybe Ben just needs to read a bunch of inane trivia about the Marston House. Yeah, I mean, if the Marston House was on IMDb, we'd be fine. Yeah, you could just read about like who, who, who was the cinematographer. And <laughs> yeah, anyway. At 5 p.m., we meet Matthew Burke, an elderly high school English teacher that actually really, really enjoys his job. So he's doomed. Oh, that's a shame. Um, <laughs> uh, Burke, M- Matt. Let's call him. Uh, he's actually my favorite character. I don't think it's just because his name is Matt. Um, I think he's just like a sort of interesting fellow who I, well, I actually thought about him the most after putting the book down this week. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Like it's 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 because he doesn't really remind me of any archetype, honestly. Like he's this person who enjoys his work for its own sake, not particularly great at it, nor really recognized for it, but he works hard at it. He manages to inspire some of his students like he he's no Robin Williams in Dead Poet Society, but he's he's also not, you know, checked out of his job. He he's 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 not the like checked out phoning it in teacher. Um I don't know. I I just kind of related to him on some level. Yeah, I mean I think the archetype here would be that like stuck in a small town and miserable about it English mm-hmm. teacher, like who who wanted to be a writer or I think in his case, like he writes plays mm-hmm. and produces plays for the school. And so like is resentful about the fact that he never made it and is taking it out on the kids. You know, I wonder, like, again, this is a lot of speculation here, but before King made it, he was working as an English teacher, right? right? And so I wonder if he encountered a character like Matthew Burke at his school, yeah. a, a man that had devoted his entire career to this thing and was still doing the work. And 
maybe wanted to be a writer just like King did and King's knocking on the door of making it. This is book number two. He's going to be huge. And he pays a little respect to these people he met in his life. Um, because I mean, I think, I think there, there is something Herculean, I think in being a person in your sixties at the end of your career, doing this thing with children who can be the worst. Yeah. Um, and, and still having the passion and the drive and the care to to be good at that job. Um, yeah. I have I have the utmost respect for teachers of all kinds, but especially older teachers who have been doing this for so long. Yeah, I think the most interesting part was going through the litany of all of the like terrible pranks that they had pulled on him, and how yeah. he like f- far from wearing him down, he he has, just has this attitude of like he barely even notices that it that it happens. Yeah, he just it's just utterly unimportant to him. He just wants to get back to teaching mm-hmm. um I, I love that yeah it's it's really great um not much else to say about him for now at least yeah yeah so at 6 p.m we finally head over to the nortons for the dinner ben will be attending this section matt is told primarily through the point of view of bill norton susan's father a serious-minded man who likes serious-minded men and uh thus we learn he likes ben mears a whole whole lot I love this section so much. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's very, uh, I mean, we're back with Ben, right? And so we're, mm-hmm. we're tugging at some plot threads more directly than in the other vignettes. Uh, yeah. And so I think that's one thing that it has going for it. I love this, this part a lot. He imposed his second testing criteria. Like a beer, got some ice out yonder. He gestured toward the back of the patio, which he had built himself. Art farts invariably said no. Most of them were potheads and couldn't waste their valuable consciousness juicing. Man, I'd love a beer, Ben said, and then the smile became a grin. Two or three, even. Bill's laughter boomed out. Okay, you're my man. Come on. So this might be a little aggressive and playing into dated gender stereotypes, but like, I think King basically perfectly captures the tension and uncertainty of meeting the girl you're dating's father. Like, Uh this is something I experienced multiple times throughout my life, and like, I once dated a girl whose both her parents were in the army. Her father was like a, a corporal in the army Uh um and it was one of the most nerve-wracking and intense situations (laughs) in my life and i was being tested in the exact same ways that that ben is being tested here like right like handshake do you want a beer no is always the wrong answer to that question um help me with the barbecue yes please i will like these are it's just yeah. King is spot on here with yeah. the feeling and the tone and the the steps of these kind of interactions are. Right, right. Yeah. Are you being set up to fail by being told to light the coals? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I, I seriously the girl I was dating at the time like prepped me, was like, do not say no to a beer. Do not say no to a beer. If he asks you if you want a beer, you say yes. You can sip on it all night if you want to, uh-huh. but you say yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's the bread and salt of American culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I love the moment where Bill is relieved when Ben is like, "Oh yes, yes, please God, give me a beer." Um, but the mom is just like instantly like more wary and distant, um, and never really on thaws. It's so great. Yeah, I mean, it's it is interesting because the, the whole the whole thing is here that. We're we're getting hints that that our, our boy Ben Mears is not does not have a healthy relationship with alcohol. That's um, right. Uh, we'll put that as kindly as possible. But it is that that seems to endear him to Bill. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, Bill also does not have a kindly uh, have a good relationship with alcohol, and I think mm-hmm. that his wife knows it. So yes, yes. Um, because the, as we see, yeah, like the the dinner goes great. Bill loves Ben Mears, but uh, Susan's mother does does not. She's not not i think it says she never thawed to him yeah i like i i guess i do like that bill or I, I don't know if like is the right word like i think it's really interesting that it's like okay this guy's a professional writer can you think of anyone more art farty than a professional fiction writer yeah but it's like well that's not actually what bill is concerned with bill is actually concerned with a constellation of other uh personality traits and mm-hmm. it's like well he's a writer but he seems very workmanlike about his writing like he's yes. he, he's like i have to get back to my work now and it's like okay yeah. well he's a serious man that's all that matters it doesn't matter that he's writing it matters what his attitude is yeah i think the thing that finally 
completely wins him over is no, I can't take another beer. I have to go home and and do some more writing. And if I if I drink any more, everything tomorrow will be illegible. And and I think it's like a man who would do work after dinner is my kind of man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is really interesting. I, I I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. And I mean, the interesting point that is like it, Bill is not into Floyd Tibbetts at mm. all. Um, which you think like he would be the exact kind of not the opposite of the art fart, right? He would be the, like he's, he's a blue collar worker. And so you would think that this man would be exactly who Bill Norton would want his daughter dating, but no, it's, it's his, it's Susan's mother that is way more into Floyd, not Bill. It's interesting. Yeah. We, we don't know Floyd very well yet. Uh, we're about to meet him, but mm-hmm. but even then, I'm I'm still very interested to see where we go with the whole Floyd situation. Sure. Speaking of which, at 7 p.m., we cut from the successful meet of the parents on the second date moment to Susan's other boy toy, Floyd Tibbetts. Floyd is getting drunk after work. Um, I, I think this is really interesting because I think King is trying to make direct comparisons here, right? We just had Ben Mears, not one that's shining away from the drink, but the one who said, I'm done drinking tonight. I got more work to do. Floyd, on the other hand, I'm off work. I'm going to get wasted. And I think yeah. we're trying to make that comparison. Yeah, I think you're right. We also learned that when the milkman is Floyd's uncle, because everyone in this fucking town <laughs> is related to everyone. Uh-huh. Um, and so his his plans of getting wasted tonight are are interrupted by hearing the news of his uncle's dead dog we get this little bit beat here that i think is worth bringing up that the bartender is convinced that it's it's devil worshipers that have done this kids today um it, another kind of a line on these people in town or certain people in town being convinced they understand what the world is like but we've been told explicitly by the book that this town is so removed from the rest of the world that it's not they're just observing it they're not actually experiencing it yeah yeah right right so what did you think of floyd though um so it's interesting because i was expecting to not like floyd Mm -hmm. like i think i think i just totally fell into tropes because like you know the current boyfriend of the hero's love interest has just got to be an abusive bully or really dumb or, or you know, maybe he's rich and spoiled and entitled like there's there's sort of a few options you have but no floyd is just kind of like actually seemingly somewhat like ben although not 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 identical obviously yeah but like he's he, not yeah he's not biff tannen he's not biff tannen exactly that's a great that's a great point that's a great like comparison point he's a decent guy he cares about his uncle he's genuinely upset when he learns that his uncle's dog was killed and he likes to drink beer and overall yeah. you're just like oh huh <laughs> <laughs> um i my, my i feel like like the amount of time we spent almost building up the idea of Floyd made me even more surprised when we met him and he was just like, Oh, okay. Uh. Yeah. I mean, and it, we still reserve the right to retract every nice thing we say if Floyd really biffs it out. But, um, right. Right. But I, I do think you're onto something here that like the, we King made Floyd be related to win so he could show Floyd's reaction to something terrible happening to a, a relative of him, a member of his family. And Floyd's reaction is to be horrified and to say, okay, I got to go be with my uncle because I understand he's going through some shit, so I need to help him out. Right. And that is the book going out of its way to show Floyd extending kindness to someone. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and he, he, I mean, like his, his reaction or not, his, he doesn't know what Susan's doing, but he doesn't like – really say anything super disparaging about susan either like he he considers her his girl and knows that like if i'm ever going to get serious with him i'll have to become a serious man which again relates back to bill and bill's understanding of ben what he's what he says specifically if i recall is like she'll come around eventually Mm -hmm. which to me indicates that he knows that there's not that things aren't perfect between them but doesn't necessarily mean that he knows that she's like actively seeing other people. I, 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 don't, know. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we get spared. Like the bartender knows that Susan's out running out with a writer, right? right, right. But the bartender doesn't tell Floyd that. So yeah. we don't know what his reaction to that is going to be. I'm sure it's not going to be a great reaction, but yeah, like I think you're right that, that there's been different people think that the two of them are, more serious than others do right Right. like susan's mother thinks they're very serious 
Susan doesn't seem to think so. Floyd wants them to be, but yeah, I mean, he's kind of acknowledging that like, they're not like, they're not going steady to right. use the, the dated term. They're, they're not going steady. Like she hasn't committed to him, I, mm-hmm. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And he knows that he thinks that she will eventually. Yeah. And I, I think he'd be fair in thinking that in a town that they're just not too many, <laughs> too many options here. Right. Right. But that's Floyd. At 7.30 p.m., we meet Danny Glick, who's going over to his new friend Mark Petrie's house. This is what we talked about earlier, that Mark Petrie is uh, being brought back into the story. Danny is kind of forced to take his little brother Ralphie with him, which uh, we've all been there, right? Yep. Yeah. (laughs) I have never had a little brother. I had a little sister, and so I would not have had to take my little sister to go play monsters with my friend. But I mean, in all seriousness, I think I always wanted my little brother around but i'm yeah I'm you're the way. nicest i yeah. we get it matt you're yeah. the best sibling ever yeah, i'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're <laughs> perfect uh, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's true but i mean <laughs> you're the one saying it so. um so i think this section is really one of the first big real horror moments of the novel right matt uh yes and it is scary um mm-hmm. like I, I i feel like having read the dark tower which did not actually focus that much on straightforward horror i have like this massive underrepresentation of stephen king's horror writing and so it's very fun for me to f- like sort of finally get to this sort of thing where it's like oh oh this is this is unnerving like this is really working this is really good yeah he's um, good at it yeah absolutely so can you believe that stephen king good <laughs> at horror yeah I, I would never have guessed um yeah so they're walking through the woods and i love that danny starts the scene like trying to scare his little brother and right. then as things get creepier and creepier that kind of backfires and he ends up scaring himself as well yeah um, i love how he's like self-justifying where he's like he he clearly is is scared and wants to stick with his brother because he's scared but he's like i'm gonna stick with my brother so he's not too scared yeah i'm gonna and, help him out i'm gonna help him out yeah exactly exactly um i, I love this section here no danny really can't you feel it Danny stopped, and in the way of children, he did feel something and knew they were no longer alone. A great hush had fallen over the woods, but it was a malefic hush. Shadows urged by the wind twisted languorously around them, and Danny smelled something savage, but not with his nose. That That's fucking brilliant. <laughs> like, yeah, he smelled something savage, but not with his nose. That's such it's, a charged sentence. I love it to death. I, me too. Me too. But I'm like, sure the kids are going to be fine, though. So because you're like, what does that mean? What yeah. do you mean? How? What? What? But yeah. you also know exactly what it means. Yeah, right. I mean, a small part of me was was doing the thing where I'm like, oh, are they like kids and they have The Shining? And then I was just, I was kind of like, I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's like The Shining. I think it's just like a, a, a vampire is already a supernatural entity of evil, and and it, it, it makes sense that you sort of like sense its evilness. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I like the, in the way of children, right? Like. Yeah, he, like th- it's almost if King is saying that like children have this extra perception that mm-hmm. adults have lost. Sure, that they know something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I like that. I'm I'm always I always think it's interesting how my my kids go through developmental stages of being scared of, like for example, like I think I think at some point all three of them have like called out in the night and been like. I'm scared of that like pile of clothes on the floor there. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like, it's just a pile of clothes. And then I'm like, okay, but like they're attuned to different things than we're attuned to. And like a little, like, like, like j- j- just speaking, you know, evolutionarily kids should be scared of different things than adults are because kids are super vulnerable to everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so it, like like kids kids are scared of things because they're super vulnerable like it totally makes sense and so it makes sense they would have like a heightened sense of, of like perceptivity to this sort of thing yeah i like that i mean it is really fascinating i had i had thrown a hoodie of mine on the the banister of my bed mm-hmm. and just the way it was thrown there it made it look exactly like the nun from the conjuring <laughs> movies and i mean but the thing with that is like I'd be sitting in bed and I'd see it. And like for a fraction of a second, my brain would be like, oh, shit, that's the nun. Uh And then my brain would catch up to myself and be like, nah. But like a kid. Like it's 
they're, they're just their imagination and their yeah. perception of the world like no it it is that that right. is that is what it is right yeah and, or or just like the clothes on the floor they become an alligator yeah even if it doesn't look anything like an alligator it's just but like it, but it is that yeah. they like yeah. the, the, the the like i i obviously you kind of lose memory of being a kid but i do i remember even not specifically just the feeling that like that there were actual dangerous otherworldly things out there right that they're like that they they definitely exist and they're there and they could harm you at any moment without you knowing and it's just like yeah. i don't know it's just like it's it's a it's a whole different kind of existence yeah yeah i mean i think a lot more kids probably survived because they were overly cautious than sure sure than survived because they were like there's probably no snakes in this grass <laughs> just i remember you know taking out the trash at night and it's like you you walk the trash can down to the curb and then you turn around to walk back up to the house uh-huh. and then you are just sure uh, like with zero doubt there is something behind me and yeah. it is sprinting up to me right now Absolutely. And, and i just would take off running up the driveway like and it's you just there's no doubt it's just like i'd be in the shower and like there's like i think i think i saw the shining when i was way too young and i just had like no doubt when i was standing in the shining that the scary naked lady from the shining Uh was on the other side of this shower curtain like Uh i just zero doubt in my mind absolutely yeah what's funny is for me it was no it's never i was never afraid that it was like a bear or a person it was always like an alien or something you know (laughs) it's always the otherworldly stuff Yeah, yeah exactly yeah because like there's no way there's a bear in your bathroom but like (laughs) Yeah, well, a bear is too mundane, mm-hmm. and, and a person is too—I don't know—it doesn't seem scary enough for some reason, even though it's much more likely technically. Yeah. Um. Uh. But yeah, there's definitely an alien behind the shower curtain, though. <laughs> this is why I like reading, and why I like reading Stephen King in particular, because like these are not things I think about on a regular basis. Like channeling my childhood and what it was like to be a child is not something that pops into my head randomly but the way he writes these experiences allows you to tap into those memories right. that you have of your own yeah i mean you know there i i love the movie jurassic park as a film but i've always sort of been a, a little bit resentful toward the movie because prior to jurassic park i just thought dinosaurs were awesome and cool and then after jurassic park i was actually like scared that the velociraptor <laughs> was gonna was gonna come out from under my bed and kill me and it sort of I don't know if it soured me on dinosaurs because I still love dinosaurs, but it, it like it changed the whole tenor of the thing because they became a monster. Um, I don't know. That's just a, a thing that I thought of. I, I was just remembering that I used to be afraid that like I used to be afraid that a T-Rex was going to bust through the wall of my bedroom, like just spontaneously. Its head was just going to crash through the wall of my bedroom. And it was going to eat me. So there we go. We've with all the cards are on the table now, Scott. <laughs> wow. I love it. Um, do we want to move on? I think we spent too much time. I on think this. so. Uh, I appreciated you sharing, Matt, but we have to move on. We it's did. nine o'clock, and we have to meet Mavel Wirtz. All right. Again, with the names, <laughs> Mavel Wirtz, <is> town <laughs> gossip. Yes, yes. Not much to say about Mavel. Um, we just see her being a gossip and staring at the Marsden house and also listening in on phone lines, but. I just, this paragraph, we have to read it. Yes. She was a gossip, but not a deliberately cruel one. Although those whose stories she had spied on their back fence might tend to disagree. She simply lived in and for the town. In a way, she was the town. A fat widow who now went out very little, and who spent most of her time by her window dressed in a tent-like silk camisole, her yellowish ivory hair done up in a coronet of thick, braided cables, with the telephone in her right hand and her high-powered Japanese binoculars on the left. The combination of the two, plus the time to use them fully, made her a benevolent spider sitting at the center of a communications web that stretched from the bend to East Salem. Yeah, so there's our communications web. We also yep. learned that the telephones are all like connected and you can just pick up the phone and listen to other people's conversations. What the fuck? Is this a yeah. real thing? This, I mean, this is. This is when, when you know, earlier in, when telephones were being spread out and uh-huh. telephone lines were being laid and and brought to towns you had a thing called a party line where they didn't have enough to run separate lines to each and every house so they just split one line to like five houses so like it's all in the same line and you take turns and like you pick up the phone 
and anyone else in your party line can listen on your phone. That was a real oh, thing wow. that happened for a very, very long time uh, until everyone got their own personal phone lines. The past is truly a foreign country. <laughs> uh, so my favorite line in that, maybe my favorite line in this whole thing is, in a way, she was the town. Yeah. Because, um, like, man, you got to have a lot of confidence as a writer to do that, right? Yeah. It, it'd be like if Golding had, in Lord of the, uh, Lord of the Flies, been like, the conch was the sole tool of order. In a way, it was order. Or it's just like you're just saying your metaphor, um, but but he, he, but it works. Like it works perfectly here. Like it didn't it didn't it doesn't jag you out of the story. Um, yeah, it's just a perfect paragraph overall. And it also allows you. Like I think we're 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 coming up on the very end of the chapter, right? We we've now spent fifty pages learning about all the denizens of Salem's Lot, and then here the last person we meet is Mabel Warts. And she is the town. And what is it? What does Stephen King mean by that? A fat widow who now went out very little and who spent most of her time by the window. Uh -huh. Like, so like, in, so, so what does it mean that Mabel works is the town? Well, insular, concerned with the business of everyone else. And um, uh, like, it, it, it's fascinating, right? Yeah. Like King is like laying his cards down and saying what he thinks of Salem's Lot as a yeah. town. We we kind of got an idea of that throughout the rest of these little vignettes, but here it is at the center of all of this is this person, right? I this, mean, this thing. The, the idea that she has the phone in her right hand and the binoculars in her left is like her two implements of spying mm -hmm. are just constantly at hand, and that is the, that is what the town is constantly up its own ass <laughs> yeah yeah just, Very true. just sort of sort of spying on itself in this way and mm -hmm. and self-involved um and and it, it turned inward um yeah yep 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 but we have one more little vignette to do matt it's eleven fifty nine. it's the end of the day and we return to the harmony hill cemetery where a dark figure is speaking in a soft and cultured voice Oh, my father, favor me now. Lord of flies, favor me now. Now I bring you spoiled meat and reeking flesh. I have made sacrifice for your favor. With my left hand, I bring it. Make a sign for me on this ground, consecrated in your name. I wait for a sign to begin your work. There was no sound, but, the, but that brought on the breeze. The figure stood silent and thoughtful for a time. Then it stooped and stood with the figure of a child in its arms. I bring you this. It became unspeakable so i that that's that's so great everything about <laughs> this is great so what's funny is i'm not exactly sure and, I, and i'm fine not being sure but i guess i'm assuming this is barlow and not straker because otherwise i feel like it would have just said like it's straker and i don't know it just seems and then the fact that it becomes unspeakable you're like yeah it's mm -hmm. probably the vampire um but it's it's an interesting exchange or a ritual or whatever like he's performing a ritual is yeah. he is he is he performing a ritual for satan or is it for the crimson king is this too early in the in the universe for there to really be a, a concept of a crim crimson king um i mean we know the little the literal crimson king is literally part of the story because salem's law is part of the dark tower um yeah. so yeah, I don't know. Like it, it, it was it was exciting to me to read this, and it left me with a lot of questions. But questions in a way that was like fun to think about. Yeah, I mean, it, you're right. There's a, there's a lot of questions here. I, there's not much I can say about it, but I, I like what you're picking up on. I think when it comes to the Crimson King, I don't care if his name is in this or not. He's he's an integral part of Stephen King's multiverse, and even if he wasn't invented when these words were written, it doesn't matter to us. So we can we can say, yeah, I mean, we know from Per Callahan that vampires are agents of the Crimson King, mm -hmm. like all the vampires we see in some way or another are working for the Crimson King. So why not? Let's just say, yeah, let's yeah. get yeah, This is this is him right here. And that's who he's, you know, praying to. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. I wait for a sign to begin your work. So it's like he's here he, uh, once again. They're not just here to eat some people, right? Mm -hmm. There, there's, there's a purpose here. There's yeah. something we're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's, it's, there's a bit more ceremony to it than just like they move, they move from town to town, feeding to prolong their unnatural lives. It's, mm -hmm. they see themselves as being on a mission. I like that. Yeah, yeah. and things are not looking good for the Glick family. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure the kids are fine. I'm sure this no, is fine. an unrelated kid. Totally fine. Yeah. yeah. Just another kid. Yeah. We we left a kid 
being enveloped by some dark shadow. And then the next time we see a dark shadow, they're holding a child in their arms, no. but probably a different unrelated thing. coincidence. Yeah. All right. That is the end of chapter three. The lot. I really enjoyed that conversation, but we got to move on. Do we got any dark tower connections this this week? Um, I'm going to be cruel uh -huh. and say there was a dead pet companion impaled on something. Yeah. So, this oi. I mean, it's possible that that is a dark tower connection, right? Like maybe, maybe because because this is related to the dark tower, so maybe King yeah. was kind of in, in his in his mind referencing that. <laughs> I mean, I already kind of mentioned the idea that we have kids who feel things with their minds, mm -hmm. with their sh with their child shining, and then we had a forty minute digression on childhood <laughs> fears. So. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think you're onto something there. I think the connections, at least this early in the story, are not going to be as direct and literal. We're going to have to kind of dive into the subtext and the, the theming. And I think we are seeing stuff here. We're seeing, yeah, children who feel things. Um, I think you're kind of seeing cotetness. We talked about that with our meat deep mm. last week, which I mean, the, the response to the meat deep was just <laughs> overwhelmingly positive. I knew it would be. I knew that I could count on everyone. I appreciated that one person who spelled it, spelled it out M-E-A-T, uh -huh. like like our meat cute mm. turned into something involving meat, meat, which deep, which is just delightful to me. I don't know if they did that on purpose, but it was delightful. It's, it's a it's a great twist on it. And I'm just taking that as my headcanon. And that's, that's totally <laughs> what I meant the whole time, actually. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Um, that's all I have for Dark Tower Connections this week. I didn't really have anything else. Um, I, I guess we should say Father Callahan is once again mentioned offhandedly, right? Um, I yeah. think it is the, our poor little 17 year old mother who... Uh, is talking about marriage and and how she's not feeling great about her marriage and said, but Father Callahan said that is yeah. it was a holy thing. So uh, yeah, Father Callahan, it, who we know is basically full of shit at this point. I mean, it is. I guess were you surprised that our big Salem's Lot town vignette did not include Father Callahan? Oh, I guess I wasn't surprised because it didn't occur to me. But maybe I guess I did see him as being more central to the story than it seems like he's going to be so mm -hmm. so no i wasn't surprised but kind of when you asked the question in, in retrospect i i guess i figured i would have seen more of him by now yeah i mean I, once again 120 pages into this novel and no no yeah. father callahan yeah yeah i mean it seems like he's just not going to be that important of a character unless he like sort of swoops in and suddenly becomes really important which, which i don't think possible yeah it's possible yeah all right, Matt, let's move on to the discussion question for last week. Our question was, what makes a good prologue? Please give us some examples of good prologues. And I, I got to say, we asked this question like knowing that you and I don't really like prologues. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were kind of being like, convince me, people. Right. Um, and I, I really did appreciate a lot of your responses. Yeah, so let's let's get into some of these. So Pear Jane says that uh, they say, I count among the folks who really enjoy prologues that maybe I've, I've been lucky. I disagree with Walking Dude 22 um, and it's some other comment on this thread. I mm -hmm. think a great prologue is not effectively chapter one, but rather it's purposefully outside the main primary narrative. It's a way for the author to set the tone that is counter to chapter one's tone. In the example of Ghost Story and Salem's Lot, they tell you in advance not to be fooled by the niceties um, that you're reading because shit's going to go down in a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, they also say, um, they also say another good example is in the beginning prologue in Terry Pratchett and Neil Gaiman's good omens before we get into Adam and the them, which is the, uh, which is the uh, kind of main characters of the story. Yeah. The author set the stage in tone with an, a with an angel and demon chatting cheekily about the Bible's, prologue um literally in the garden of eden um <laughs> demonstrating that they had more in common with each other uh than with their co-workers in heaven and hell and thus laying the groundwork for a delightful vaguely romantic biblical buddy comedy <laughs> uh yeah that's, that's another book that we covered in the uh in the book club by the way we did yeah um, um i think that was god is that our first one i think it was maybe <laughs> i don't know yeah but no that was a, that was a fun book um that was a fun prologue Although I would have to, Alexia, I, I, I unfortunately have to push back a bit and, because that is the beginning of the story of the angel and demon who are, in my opinion, closer to being the main characters of the story yeah. than anybody. Um, 
not not I'm not saying it's like not a prologue. It's it's just like it definitely is the beginning of their story. So see that's the thing is I don't really know I I don't think I have a, a rigid definition for what a prologue is and isn't, but no. I w- I will acknowledge that is a prologue that I that I liked. So yeah, score I mean, here, one. Here's what I'm gonna say about prologues. Prologues don't kill people, authors kill people. Um That's true. I, I think I think it is not the concept of the prologue that I hate in and of itself. I think it is so often employed by authors to do like to try to be clever. Self-indulgent uh, yeah. garbage is, is like, yeah. Sure. Like they, I think a, like just when you're writing in a prologue, it, it just, I feel like many times an author gets the feeling of, oh, I don't have to follow the normal rules of storytelling and again, they're not rules, they're guidelines. I understand that. But like, I don't have to follow any of this stuff because this doesn't count because it's the prologue. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like the Tyler Durden on the airplane scene, like, like where I'm just reading it and I'm going like, how's that working out for you being clever <laughs> like that? You know, like, it's just like, I get you're, tr- you're being clever with your prologue, but I don't know. It's just, you're trying so hard to be clever. And that's yeah. not all prologues, obviously, but it's, yeah. I feel like it's the most of them I read. Right. I, I, it is most of them. Like I, I have a good example of a prologue. I think that the the prologue of um, a Game of Thrones is a great prologue, and it's actually a self contained short story, mm-hmm. which introduces the characters, introduces conflicts between them, uh, executes a, a, an arc for the characters, and ends, and then leads into the main story. Like that, that's a great prologue, actually. How do you feel? about the rest of the prologues in the song of ice and fire series see they they don't they're not nearly as good um no some of them are indeed um stories that have a character who gets their own little arc but 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 a lot of them they don't have any of the of that weight to them they're just like okay whatever i I don't don't, don't care yeah i feel like after martin established that in the first one he just said i have to do this in every book and so he did it yeah. for no reason other than to do it and it's just like just start the story that's what so much of prologues i'm like just start the book just start the book yes i i i don't like i i, don't, I really only like the prologue to a game of thrones so and i think that one makes sense and let's go on to more questions more yeah. answers because we're we're gonna be circling around this sure. for a while so we have baby can you dig your sam who says that pear jane stole their original answer which was good omens luckily i had a few more choices up my sleeve choice number one is hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the prologue's irreverence and dry witty humor clearly lets the reader know that what they are getting themselves into a very different kind of science fiction book choice number two which is for you matt this is for you is the fellowship of the ring in a typical world building form tolkien gives us almost 20 pages of prologue introducing readers to hobbits pipeweed shire government the finding of the ring and the shire's historical archiving of texts readers are introduced to scores of family names in middle earth places many of which i'm not even sure turn up anywhere else in the books arguably the most important section of the prologue is the part concerning the finding of the ring which counts for only four pages those unfamiliar with the hobbit are brought up to speed and those more familiar with the hobbit are introduced to the idea that the ring Bilbo got from Gollum maybe more important than we previously thought. Okay, Matt, I'm going to do a thing that might make you angry. Uh huh. I don't like the prologue in the Fellowship of the Ring. I don't think it's necessary, and I think all those elements could have just been told during the story proper, and they kind of are wow. told during the story proper. What are we calling the prologue? Do I just not remember this? Is I mean, there's a. There, it literally says prologue. It's literally a prologue. I guess yeah. I just need to look at it again because I don't remember there being a prologue. Um, it has been a long time since I've read that, even though I, I mean, I, I famously love the Lord of the Rings. It has been a long time since I actually read it. Um, I'll have to look again and maybe, maybe this will single-handedly change my opinion about prologues. <laughs> Although I, I think you're probably right, Scott, that, um, we get all that information in the story anyway, and the stuff we don't get, we don't really need to know. It's just, it's just that Tolkien loves to tell us all this information. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Next. Um, walking dude 22 says what makes a good prologue for the record I tend to agree that prologues tend to be misused and distracting sometimes they work I feel that the good ones feel organic to the story and could effectively be called chapter one I feel like good prologues can change the whole story consider how different the story is if you only get that short version that sh- the, the short story version consisting of the prologue and epilogue consider also the narrative without the introduction and denouement how does the story differ in each case? One good example of, of one that works is in Audrey uh, Niffenegar's novel 
the time traveler's wife. In this case, the prologue establishes the big picture of each of the two main characters and the premise of the story before throwing you into the deep end in a uniquely structured narrative. Um, and, and then also... Also, well, well, let's let's talk about that oh, first okay. a little bit, okay, because sure. I, I think Walking Dude is onto something here. And I think I think the trick for me with prologues and epilogues is I want to be told the reason why this isn't just part of the main story. And like, I think with I think Salem's Lot is a great example, like it's establishing a conceit of how the book is going to work in certain ways, that this is a flashback mm-hmm. that um, and, and maybe you could argue that. Salem's lot and at the end of the day will work better without the prologue in it at all. Um, I don't know, but it it seems like it has a reason for existing outside of, I just wanted to tell a story that exists in my world that has nothing to do with my characters. And so I couldn't find a way to make this information work in the story itself. So I threw it at the beginning um, and maybe 700 pages later you'll get a little inkling as to what this has to do with anything else that's in the rest of my book brandon uh-huh. um i think that's <laughs> what most people do with them so yeah i mean i i think walking dude is onto something that like i've not read the time traveler's wife but i understand enough of that story to know that like yeah it's it's doing some heavy lifting in in establishing stuff that it is literally impossible to establish in the the story proper itself just because of the way that story is structured yeah, maybe. I mean, here, so, so like, here's another, here's another sort of almost reverse example. So we recently read for the book club, um, this is how you lose the time war. Mm-hmm. And that was a book where I, I, I ended up loving the book. It has no prologue. The beginning of the book, I found very confusing to the point of, of almost being like, oh my God, this is going to be exhausting, isn't it? Like, and, and the reason was I couldn't tell what the hell was going on. <laughs> and that is a book where it's like, well, that, that tempts you to be like, well, maybe they should have had a little prologue that explained what this whole time war thing was. But, but, I, but in retrospect, you know, having read the whole book, I'm like, no, it eventually became fun when you realized that part of the fun of the book is kind of unspooling the mystery of what's what exactly is going on. And a prologue would have mostly just spoiled that. So that's a case where if it, if the book had had a prologue, then we might be sitting here saying, this is how you lose the time war. You couldn't have understood that story without it, without the prologue. And it's like, yeah, you could, it's just a little bit harder that mm-hmm. you would just would have had to do a little bit more front loading and, and yeah. structure. But, um, yeah, and and I I think I want to say like we're being a little cheeky and dismissive. Yeah, um, we, yeah, I, I love yeah. you, Brandon Sanderson. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to be mean. I think it, writing stories is really hard, and I do think there there is a fear, especially with these unique kind of story structures, that you're like afraid that people won't get it, and like a lot of people can use prologues as like a crutch to like calm your nerves about that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I totally get that. I, I wonder if there were talks during the creation of this is how you lose the time war about do we need something up front to set the state set the stage a little bit? Do we need something? And they they ultimately decided no. And I, I think the book is better for it mm-hmm. for sure. Um, yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I I would understand the desire to do that. Yeah, right, sure. I, I I was gonna rag on Sanderson again, but let's just let's just, let's, let's just <laughs> let's move on. Poor, let's leave poor, incredibly successful and beloved author yeah. Brandon Sanderson alone. It's just the prologues; they're just the worst. Okay, anyway, yeah. um, let's let's move on. Okay, um, I just wanted Walking Dude had some interesting stuff that I I oh. couldn't find a way to work organically in anything else that I thought it'd be fun to talk about. Okay. as well. Um, so yeah, Walking Dude goes on to say. As to Dark Tower connections, I think that the structure itself mirrors the gunslinger. We have a tale about a man and a boy, Ben slash Roland and boy slash Jake. The story is told primarily via flashback format. It'll be interesting to consider this story through the lens of addiction and sacrifice. We know from the Dark Tower that Callahan has his own addictions. Ben's writing habits point to some low-grade alcoholism. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely something there, right? Yeah, I like that. Um and then also the bulk of the novel is is uh, remembrance. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there is an interpretation of this story wherein a writer returns to his hometown and becomes the impetus of its destruction, um, but, huh. which is, yeah, 
interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the main thing they talked about is like, maybe we could assign some unreliable narrator to the story because be, because of the prologue in the story, we have been told that this is remembrance. And so is it being remembered correctly, <laughs> accurately? That's, that's great. Yeah. Well, once again, I remember Ghost Story where there's a, there's a theme of a, a character who's a writer who turns some of his experiences into a novel. Um, mm -hmm. um, that's a fun idea. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, yeah. it, I, I, I don't get the sense that there's an unreliable narrator at play, but it's, it's always fun to consider that option. Sure. Yeah. I think walking dude says that they don't think that's what King is actually doing here. I don't think so either, but yeah, that's, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about storytelling and, and analysis is we could just take this book from the lens of an unreliable narrator and see what that says about what's going on here. Right. It's fun. Yep. All right. Damien to me says, I'm surprised people have such a strong dislike of prologues. A little Googling and I discovered it is a very divisive issue. Elmore Leonard said to avoid them. Another writer said, if you're going to include one, don't call it a prologue because as soon as people see that word, they'll close the book. <laughs> I guess I'm confused by the hate because there's so many good ones. I think when I first started reading, I enjoyed prologues in books like Paolo Cola's The Alchemist and Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babbitt. Uh, I've definitely read Tuck Everlasting. I don't remember it enough to remember the prologue. I haven't read either of those. Yeah. A good prologue will have a beginning, middle, and end. They set the tone or introduce the themes. Sometimes they have a hook to suck you in, immediately creating intrigue. I mean, come on, Tolkien and King use prologues. Why are we even debating this? But Tolkien's was bad, though. It reminds me of people <laughs> saying they don't like films that use voiceover. And if you consult the list, Citizen Kane, Sunset Boulevard, Goodfellas. So hashtag justice for the prologue. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't really disagree with anything you've said here, Damien. I, I think... I think that I agree. A, a good prologue is basically a short story, which serves as a sort of appetizer to the meal where, where you're like, you're like, okay, you, you have, you have told a good short story in the world, which introduced me to the world, which maybe introduced me to some of the ideas and themes, maybe even some of the characters. Then again, maybe not. That's less important. I think it's fine for us to have, have, have a prologue where we don't actually know any of the characters. Um, but it does have to be a story that has to have a beginning, middle and end. Otherwise, it's just chapter one, but a bad chapter one. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, and I'm being really pedantic here, but like I agree with all that stuff totally. But I can't help but in the back of my head ask the question, why can't the story just do that? Like it introduce the world, introduce the themes, introduce the tone. Like you can just do that in the story itself. Well. Okay, so so here's my like attempt to defend the idea. I'm going to I'm going to go back to Game of Thrones because that's one that I've thought the most about. Um Game of Thrones actually begins very slow. Um there's there's a ton you have to introduce a ton of characters. There's so mm -hmm. many goddamn characters that you have to introduce. And they all have really great character introductions, but it's like introduction after introduction after introduction after introduction, right? And of course, also interesting stuff is happening in those chapters. That's, that's true. It's a, it's a good book. Like it, it's famous for a reason. Um, but it really, really helps that you have this hook at the beginning of the story, which is sort of promising. There's going to be supernatural stuff. There's a mystery at play. There's going to be sword fights. And then you don't see any of that for the first like half of half of the book, right? <laughs> but it's it's a it's a little taste. It's like I said, it's a little appetizer. It's a little taste of what's to come. And then George R. R. Martin is able to take his time with the beginning of the book, and and he sort of gets your patience and your buy-in because of that prologue. I I see that. Yeah. When is the first time we see the others outside of that prologue? Is it even in this book? I don't remember. Um, yeah, it's been way too long. I, I well, thought I, it was. I know there's a, there's a white that gets in to the the. Oh, I, it's been so. I can't even remember. What the, is the Night Watch? The the wall, the the Black Keep, or whatever. Yeah, the Black Keep. Thank you. There's a white that gets in there, but not another. I don't think we see others until they go ranging north of the wall in the next book. Yeah, I don't actually remember when they do that. It doesn't matter. I, mean, <laughs> I, I agree with you in some point because there's like. A lot of the early parts of that book is the kids being told stories about scary stuff in the world. And th it is emphasized over and over again that these are just stories and none of these things exist. And us readers being equipped with knowledge of, uh-uh, right. <laughs> they, they do actually, um, is, is important to 
that. So yeah, I mean, I think that's a good argument that I understand. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. Last, no, not last. Next comment from a reader. Um, Jeremy K says, really under the gun here, pun intended, but I think a good prologue can be something as good as Kings in Salem's Lot, or they can act as a kind of appetizer for the main course of the book. Great minds think alike, Jeremy. <laughs> it will sell you on preparing for the flavor of the main course, as opposed to reading the back of the book cover, which once gave away half of a which which once gave away half of a book. Imagine my annoyed frustration as I read a major story beat, then quickly glance at the back of the book, only to say, "Yep, that figures." Okay, I do enjoy this appetizer metaphor, but like, I don't know. Do you when you order an appetizer at dinner, are you like, this will help prepare my palate for the main course? No, you're just like, oh, yeah, some fucking uh, mozzarella sticks. Yeah. Those sound good. Right. Some egg rolls to prepare for my rice. No, <laughs> I don't know, man. Look, it's Jeremy's I'm, metaphor. I'm, okay? I'm being difficult. I've got nothing for no to reason. do with it. <laughs> no, I don't know, man. Like, 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 I get it. Like, like you don't. Here's the thing is I agree in principle that one should be able to tell a story that doesn't require that. But it's like, it's just the choice. And the thing is, if you do the choice correctly, then you write a Game of Thrones and everybody says it's awesome. And if you do the choice poorly, then it's just like, this was boring and I hated it. I mean, I think a lot of it has to do, the the thing that I'm really latching onto in your Game of Thrones example is Martin limited himself in point of view via his structural choice in the novel right the, the idea of each chapter is going to be told from a specific point of view and will not stray from that point of view until there's a new chapter yeah and therefore it limits what you can and cannot tell inside the story proper so he could not do anything in the story proper with beyond the wall with with the others with all this other stuff because none of his characters were there he was totally limited in that so he the prologue must exist because it's the only place he's allowed to break that rule, which is true. And then I'd be like, well, you, you established the rule. It's your rule. <laughs> I, I, th- I think you can make a case that, that he uses it to create a sort of tension where. Yeah, I know you're, you're totally like, I'm, as I'm making this argument, I'm making the counter argument in my head and I love those books. Yeah. So I'm not like say like, right. I love those books. Like it's sort of weird to be like, you don't like prologues? Well, one of the most successful writers of all time is able to use prologues successfully. It's like, well, yeah, okay. Of course he is. Yeah, and, and to reiterate, it's not that I don't like prologues, it's that I don't like bad prologues, yeah, right. and most prologues are bad prologues. Right, yes, yes. Okay, let's fa- we've been going on for so long. Yes. Let's go on to Steve. Okay. Steve D says, although I am always drawn to read a prologue, I usually don't care for them unless they are short and sweet. Just get to the story. I agree, Steve. If done well, they can be fun. Two examples come to mind. The Twelve by Justin Cronin. This is the sequel to The Passage. It's supposedly written 100 years in the future and essentially recaps everything that occurred in The Passage. It's written like Bible verses. It's a fascinating way to present it. Honorable mention, Final Fantasy X. The main characters are gathered around the ruined city prepping for the big battle. Kind of a cool way to introduce the game, even though I never got the hang of the stupid sphere grid thing. Uh, this brings back memories of this time last year when I uh, lost my job and decided I was going to spend my my free time while hunting for a job playing every single Final Fantasy game over and again. Uh-huh. Uh, Final Fantasy X, good story, bad game. Did you <laughs> did you get game. did you get the hang of the stupid sphere grid thing? Uh, I guess kind of. It's <laughs> not a great system. The bat the combat in that game is just so bad. Uh huh. Cool. All right. I I I think to to Steve's point, like. The prologue that is essentially what um, both Ghost Story and Salem's Lot employ, which is just it's chronologically ahead of the the story proper and sets it up as that I'm telling a story of the events that led to this point can work. Um, I don't always see a need for it. Like this is something actually on my other podcast talking about the OC with my wife, we just watched an episode that did this where they did the very classic TV trope thing where they'll cold open into in media res into a big dramatic thing. And right before they cut to the uh, title credits, something huge will happen. Like a building explodes or someone gets shot and then you'll come back from credits and we'll say 24 hours earlier Uh type thing, you know? Yeah. Um, This is thing TV loves, loves, loves doing. And this is kind of the book version of that where the prologue is, 
uh, everyone's sitting around a campfire and then we tell the story of how we got to this point. Yeah. Right. I mean, which, which is sort of a way that people literally tell stories around campfires where they're like, oh, you want to sure. you want to hear the story of the man who whose head was cut off? Well, it started this way, you know, and, and so like you have to you have to you have to give them a taste of what they're going to get. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Especially oh. in TV where you have like two minutes to hook someone in on your show. I feel like I feel like I don't know. Maybe maybe the problem is I'm just I don't I don't ever not finish a book. So like. Even if I don't like the book, I'm still going to finish it. So like the concept of I need to hook someone right away to get me through the pages doesn't apply to me because I'm like, even if I'm not hooked right away, I'm still going to finish the book. Yeah. I mean, the thing about all the Sanderson prologues is that I would have actually just literally bounced off the book and not read it if we didn't have to read them for book club. <laughs> um, and then once I got past the prologue and like actually came to care about the characters, I generally like them. Um, but uh yeah, I don't care. I don't care about just the deluge of of made up words that is a Sanderson prologue. I'm sorry. I'm I mean, sorry. The, the fortunate thing is we can just completely skip them because they don't matter. That's true. That's true. A thousand Sanderson fans just lost their minds at me saying that, yeah. but I think it's true. Yeah, I think I think you're right. We said we were going to stop being mean to Brandon. Okay, I'll try. It's it's hard. I've got a lot of resentment toward toward Brandon's prologues. All right, next. <laughs> Uh, Eric T says, I agree most prologues aren't great and the good ones invite you into the world through a general idea instead of a very specific idea. And then they say, uh, for example, what if the leading class could influence the maturing male thought process versus via Zengalian spells and technology, the pairing of the spell in Alachan and the Yichel societies rob young men of, it, and then 300 more words, um, <laughs> this is exactly what we were just talking about. It's like exactly what we were just talking about. Yeah. Where it's it, it's like, yeah, it's it's cool to introduce me to the ideas. And and I think I've said before, I like the I like the principle that you want to begin a story as close to the end as you can. Um mm-hmm. and a prologue is like the opposite of that. It's like let's just add some fluff toward the beginning. Well, and I think it's like a, a general idea of it's okay to be confusing and not make any sense because it's the prologue. And I'm just like, no, right. <laughs> you're making me read it. Right. No. Yeah. How many made up words are in the beginning of, of game of Thrones? Uh, like zero. Yeah. I don't know. They just say, sir. And they spell it with an E. Yeah. That's, I mean, that threw me for a loop for years. <laughs> I still don't get it. It wasn't until I watched the show that I was like, Oh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell if you're joking. I am. Uh, last but not least, we have Steve L who says, it's not really the exact answer to your question of the week, but anytime King writes a prologue forward or afterward, I devour it and appreciate it so much. His words are golden. Yeah. I mean, I don't actually off the top of my head, can't think of all the King books that do or do not have a prologue, but looking at our, um, looking at our season two list here, Insomnia has a prologue. Salem's Lot has a prologue. Um, I think spoilers. that's it. I think that's it. How's that spoilers? <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I like this. I like the prologue of this book, you know. Yeah, I did too. I just want an excuse to rant about Brandon Sanderson for a while. So. I understand that. And that's uh, honestly, this question was just, uh, I'm going to allow you to rant about Brandon Sanderson. I appreciate that. Speaking of which, we're going to put a Brandon Sanderson book on our next month's book club. Uh, it's I'm, probably going to have a prologue, isn't it? <laughs> of course it will i don't know if we're gonna actually do that or not the thing about our book cl- book club folks is whenever we put a sanderson na- novel up for vote our patrons always vote for it immediately so we have to do that sparingly yeah. so it's not just all sanderson all the time that's that's exactly right all right thank you so much for all your questions i thought that was a great discussion i hope you didn't get too mad at us and our hatred of prologues uh But I thought that was a lot of fun. So thanks to all those of you who participated. And please participate in next week's question, which is, Matt, you want to read this one? What is your favorite fictional town? And I'm going to put the caveat on here that if you pick Salem's Lot, Derry, or Castle Rock, aka any Stephen King fictional town, please, in your explanation of why it's your favorite fictional town, avoid spoiling uh, those books that contain that town for Matt. Um, but we want to know, like, what's your favorite created fictional town and uh, and why? What do you like? What do you like about it? Yeah, this could be really fun. I have a few. I already have a few ideas in my own head of like fun, fun towns. 
Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, that is it for us here this week. Next week, we will continue Salem's Lot with chapters four and five. We'll be reading uh, chapter four is titled Danny Glick and others. There you go, Matt. There's Danny Glick. All right. He's fine. He's fine. Good. And chapter five, Ben two. So we're moving back with good old Ben. Yeah, I'm sure it doesn't refer to Danny Glick and other victims. Um, <laughs> uh, remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod and the subreddit, uh, reddit.com slash r slash douche media is a great place to answer the discussion question, participate in discussions, post hilarious memes, etc. Yeah. Um, if you want to answer the question, any one of those that Matt just read is the place to go. Yep. Or I guess you can go to our Instagram account. You could technically answer it there as well. It's Doof Media on Instagram. Cool. If you are not already subscribed to Kingslingers, season two is in full swing. And so it's time to do it. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and anywhere else in the world that you can listen to cast pods. That's right. Um, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support them, then please consider donating to the Doof Media Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. Special thanks this week to brand new patrons, Doof Troopers, Mark O, and Siranus. Um, really hope you enjoy the, the stuff we have at that uh, Doof Trooper tier. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it, and um, I think it's actually pretty good stuff, so I hope you agree. Yeah, I think by the time everyone's listening to this, our friends Ruben and Elliot will have released episode three of their bonus podcast covering the films, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean films. We're going to be doing those as part of our Gore Verbinski coverage over the next couple of months, but they've been doing them already. So if you want to listen to some Australians talk about how much they love the Pirates films, uh, sign up for our Patreon now. Yeah. I can't wait to listen to how they react to the third film because it's fucking nuts. <laughs> it's a bananas movie. Yes. Yeah. Of course, if you cannot afford to donate to us right now, that is absolutely okay. We love each and every one of you. You can help us out in other non-financial ways by just sharing this podcast. Keep it up. Please keep sharing, especially now. There's some Salem's Lot people out there that might want to listen to us talk about it for a couple of hours. So uh, share it. And of course, you can always help us by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's Spotlight Review comes from Empty113, who gives us five stars and says, Great stories with great friends. The Dark Tower is my wife and I's favorite series of all times, so much that we named our firstborn after Roland. The podcast is an amazing way to experience a series through fresh eyes. It's full of the kind of conversations you'd have with beers, over beers with your best friends. It introduces ideas and perspectives you might not even consider otherwise, almost like making the tower to the trip for the first time. I can't remember the recommend the series enough and the hosts are perfect additions to your content. Well, thank you so much empty. I wonder if that's the same person who left us a message on our finale that they named their kid Roland or if there's, there's a couple of Roland's running out there. Either way. That's, that's very, very cool. Yeah. All right, folks, we'll see you right back here next week for chapters four and five of Salem's lot long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. Bye.